Okay, looks like we are live. Welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie, and this is my co-host, Matt. As most of you are aware by now, we have been having a ton of fun doing five months now of an Evolution Debate Challenge series. And so we are here tonight for the fifth month, the five-month anniversary special of this epic challenge. I've also got Dr. Dino here with me, of course. And uh, we've had a ton of debates now in this series. I've got it up on the website as well as in a playlist on the main channel. So please check that out. And uh, these debates have been on evolution. Evolution is on trial. And we have heard many lines of evidence for evolution, uh, so-called lines of evidence for evolution over the last five months, which is what we are here to discuss tonight. We are going to have some fun going over some of the arguments we've seen. And uh, since this is live, we will be taking some audience uh, question. So I see people flying into the live chat. If you got some questions pertaining to the creation versus evolution debates, uh, please make sure you're tagging me at Standing for Truth or even tagging Matt at uh, Young Earth Creation is, is his channel name uh, currently. So Matt is my co-host. Good to have you here, brother. How's everything going tonight? Doing good, but I'm actually logged into your account, so I won't see anybody tagging Young Earth Creation. <laughs> That being said, just tag standing for truth then. <laughs> Perfect. Yep. Doing good. This is going to be fun. Haven't had Kent here for the while, so it's always fun. Well, Matt, good to have you, brother. Dr. Dino, how are you today? How's everything at Dell? And good to have you. Yeah, we're having a blast here in Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. Visitors come even oh, Sunday, Monday. They come anyway. We're, we're, it's, it's awesome. You guys, if you ever get out of your communist Canada, come on down and see the place. <laughs> You won't believe it. Amen. Amen. Dinosaur Adventure Land will be the first destination I go to. And okay. who needs sleep these days, right? Who needs sleep? So, uh, okay, let's get right into it then. We've got a little clip to kind of kick us off for uh, for tonight. We will be discussing, as I pointed out, a lot of the lines of evidence that we've heard over the last five uh, months. ERVs, homology, nested hierarchies, vestigial organs, whale pelvis. So, But before we get into all of those, we're going to play a short clip from what I think was one of the um, more humorous moments so far over the last uh, five months. So here we go, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start our discussion. You really think an amoeba turned into a shark and a whale and everything? There is no evidence of a single cell creature ever producing even a two cell creature, let alone an elephant or a whale or a human. But they put them on, draw lines on paper. Here we got the human and the snail related. Wade, simple question. Do you believe you are related to a snail? Just a yes or no. Yeah. Okay. So SpongeBob, or no, what's his name? Dave thinks he's a strawberry. PZ Myers thinks he's a fish. Um, who's the guy who thinks he's an ape? Uh, and you think you're related to a snail. Okay, you're welcome to believe that, but that's not science. Do you believe we all came from sponges, Dave? Do you believe this textbook yes. is right? Yes. Okay, so that being said, uh, <laughs> Dr. Dino, my first question to you is, in light of all the many debates you've had, I think now probably about 285, and uh, these evolutionists believe that they are related to snails and strawberries. And they call this science. They call this empirical science. What are your thoughts on this? Is this actually science or is this more of a science fiction religion? It is complete science fiction. They draw lines on paper connecting all the animals where the humans, the bat, the dog, the bear, the mosquito, everything is related. Because after all, they drew lines on paper connecting them. This is absolute insanity. It is not science. Ask them, are you related to a ladybug and a spinach and a pine tree and a worm? Oh, yeah, they'll think they think they are. The Bible says everything will bring forth after its kind. All we've ever observed in recorded human history is dogs produce dogs, cows produce cows. There are no exceptions. If you wish to believe something other than that, well, you and SpongeBob go start your own school and teach that to whoever wants to come learn it. But it's not science. It's got to be one of the dumbest things in the history of the world that anybody ever believed they were related to a ladybug. But, okay, I'm here to help them. I really, I want to help them. 
<laughs> and and that's what we're here to do, Kent. So I appreciate that. Now, one line of evidence they'll say as to why they are, are apparently related to uh, strawberries and snails on the universal, you know, phylogenetic tree is the fact that that we share much in terms of morphology, anatomy, physiology, and uh, even genetics with all forms of life, plants, animals. So the question is, are these similarities, are these evidence for common ancestry rather than common design? Well, no, the fact that we have similar proteins, similar DNA structure to all the different animals and plants, is it's obvious. That's number one, because we have a common designer, the same God designed us all. Secondly, if there weren't a lot of similarities, we could only eat each other. See, the brown cow can eat the green grass and give the white milk and churn it and make the yellow butter, and I eat it and get the blonde hair, because the gene code is made up of, the, it's got the same proteins, the same vitamins and minerals. It's, it's, a, it's a network because it was designed to work together. And so they see these similarities and say, wow, look at that. The uh, spinach has certain uh, uh, minerals in there and humans have certain minerals. Oh, that proves they're related. No, that proves you need those minerals to eat. God designed it to be your food. If it weren't for, if, if it weren't for the similarities, we could only eat other humans. This is so dumb for them to believe that what we see causes is, is evidence for a common ancestor. No, it's a common creator and a common need. It's a network of life. So tell them I said that's dumb. <laughs> um, now, one of their typical responses, I guess I'll, I'll play as the evolutionist for a second here that I've seen over the last five months, is they'll say, well, okay, why then did God create humans so close to the chimpanzee? You know, why do we share more with, let's say, the great apes or primates in general than we do with a dog or a fish? You know, this nested hierarchy that we we can see in the biological world. You know, that'll be one of their questions. And what's the best way to respond to that, Ken? I would ask them, why do you think you're related to a chimpanzee? Is it because we both have two arms? We both have two eyes? We both have two nostrils? I mean, wh why do you think you're related to a chimpanzee? No person in their right mind wants to mate with a chimpanzee. The chimpanzees don't want to mate with the humans. The Bible says they will bring forth after their kind. If they want to get together and bring forth, they're the same kind. My cows show no interest whatsoever in the pine trees. They want another cow to mate with, not a pine tree, not a mosquito, not an armadillo, a cow. If they bring forth, they're the same kind. I don't want to be bring forth with a chimpanzee or an ape or a gorilla or an orangutan. I don't know any normal human who does. I think that's dumb. But that's how you tell. Because there are some similarities, the same God designed all the different life forms. Of course, there'd be similarities. I bet all the paintings that Picasso did have some similarities. Uh, same guy's making the painting. That's why. I don't know how they can't get it, brother. Tell me what. I've had 284, 85 debates. You're right. They don't get it. What else can I say to them? Amen. And a lot of times, you know, these, these debates are for the audience, too. You know, I've, I've heard a lot of uh, stories and, and testimonies that a lot of people came uh, to faith in Christ and Young Earth Creation by, by watching a lot of debates, specifically yours, uh, Dr. Dino. So I'd, I'd like to point out that even in the similarities that they'll point to, let's say, in genetics, and uh, we've touched on this on, on our program before, Matt. There's actually vast differences in terms of, of the way these genes that are, that are similar, let's say between humans and chimpanzees are expressed, or huge differences in terms of uh, epigenetics. So even in the similar sequences, there's massive differences that the evolutionists cannot account for, which, which I find right. interesting. Um, Matt, anything you'd like to add or a question you'd like to uh, bring to the table, brother? Sure. I like to say that they're so busy looking for all the similarities that they're blind and somewhat ignorant of all of the differences. So right. I don't know why they're so intent on ignoring the vast differences when they're so hyper focused on saying, well, look, that that, that right there shows similarity. It's like, eh. if you look into it, you're going to find a lot more differences, but they don't want to see that. So I always find that very strange. But well, um, I, think, go ahead. I think I know why. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, the scoffers are willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood and the coming judgment of God. They don't want to believe in the creation because that brings with it some accountability. Oh, there's a creator. 
Well, that would mean he owns it. That would mean he can make the rules. Oh, they don't want his rules, so they deny he exists. Not because they have reason to deny it, they just don't like his rules. They deny the flood, because that, that represents the judgment of God on his creation. They don't want to believe that God has the authority to judge his creation. They want to be their own God in their own universe. So it's obvious why they don't, they look at the, anything they can becomes evidence for evolution. It, 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 there's no reasoning with them that I've been found so far. But the debates, like Donnie said, they really do help the other people who watch. And I'm thrilled for that. Amen. Amen, brother. And um, what's interesting, Dr. Hoven, and I know you've heard this many times, Professor Dave, uh, a debate that I highly recommend, you know, the poor guy, you forced him into early retirement. And <laughs> to the uh, similarities that demonstrate common design, like I'll oftentimes point out, okay, a sedan shares more with a hatchback or an SUV than a sedan does with a boat or an airplane. So we see in de design modes of transportation, there's a hierarchy as well. That's evidence of design, not not ancestry. And what they'll say, uh, Kent, is, well, you know, cars don't reproduce. Animals reproduce in, in the biological world, as if that's going to save the day for, for fish to fisherman evolution. What's, what's a good response to that? Adding reproduction into the mix makes it a trillion times more complicated and more impossible for them to evolve. Why did all of the plants and animals evolve the ability to reproduce? Doesn't reproducing only make more mouths to feed and competition for the environment? Why didn't any of the plants or animals simply evolve the ability to live forever? Why would any animal want to make babies? It's going to increase competition for the food supply. No way they can explain that by evolution. Amen. Well said. That's why it's a fairy tale and <laughs> it takes a lot of imagination and uh, fancy storytelling. So I'm looking at your slide there from your debate with uh, Wade the Sna I mean, Wade the Wizard. And uh, one of the lines of evidence there, and this is what they'll, they'll typically do. It's called a shotgun tactic. You know, they'll just put on a slide and say there's just so many lines of evidence for evolution. Mathematics, species distribution, paleontology, biogeography. But the one I'd like to focus on here is paleontology fossils, the fossil record. You know, they'll look to some interesting creatures in the fossil record, Tiktaalik, Archaeopteryx, some of these interesting mosaics and say this is evidence for large scale evolution, universal common ancestry. Is, is that really the case there, Dr. Dino? Well, I point out, first of all, there is no such thing as a fossil record. There's no such thing. There are fossils, trillions of them. OK, but there's no record. They don't talk. There's no date on them. When you dig up a clamshell like this one. You will notice it can't talk and there's no date. You are putting your interpretation on it. All we know is it died. We don't know this one had any children that lived. We sure don't know it had children that lived that were different. No animal today can produce offspring that are different than themselves. Why would we think well, a fossil could do that? So there, there is no such thing as a fossil record to begin with. But that's what they count on. That's their best evidence. But look at the fossils. guys. If you could find 10 fossils that you could arrange in a, a order from A to Z, and they have minor changes between them, that would still not prove anything as far as similarity or relationship. I bet I could line up cars. I bet we could get a, a small uh, four, a two-door car, and then a four-door car, and then a hatchback, and, and then go up to a, a six-door car and a school bus. And So what? I lined them up. It doesn't mean anything. And same thing with animals that reproduce. Being able to line them up in some kind of order does not mean anything as far as relationship. No animal today. You could line up living animals in the same order. You could line up from clams to whales and elephants and make a, make a series of lines on paper. It doesn't mean there's a relationship. Certainly, the fossils are not going to help. So there's no such thing as a fossil record. I would, I would stop them right there. So you stop. There's no such thing. There's a bunch of fossils. No fossils are forming today. Where do we see fossils forming? Anywhere in the world. But there's trillions of fossils. I think that's evidence of a flood. Rapid burial. They all, all the fossils probably formed from that one-year flood. Not slow millions of years accumulation. It's really so dumb. They, they don't get it. As you put it, Dr. Dino, they're willingly ignorant, 2 Peter 3. And what I find interesting, one thing I'll add, and then Matt, I know you had a question, is uh, going back to the design model, the design hypothesis. 
Um, I like to point out that uh, since the Bible tells us that we're created in the image of God, maybe we can get a sense for how God designed the biological world based on how we design things. And it just so turns out that we design, as you pointed out, Kent, in homologous patterns. We design in these nested hierarchical patterns, but we also design some very interesting mosaics. Um, you know, the invention of, of the so-called crossover vehicles, you know, a combination of your vans and your SUVs or even the military, they've, they've designed um, amphibious military assault vehicles. That's not really a vehicle built for the ocean or land. It's, it's, it's that crossover transitional vehicle. This isn't evidence that, you know, one <laughs> is turning into another. This is just evidence of, of good design. And that seems to be what, what we find in, in some of these fossils. Right, each, each animal today seems to do really well in its environment. Uh, why do the cows that have their head down eating all day have such strong neck muscles and a long neck? One atheist said, well, the giraffe evolved uh, a long neck so it could reach the trees. I said, no, the giraffe has a long neck so he can reach the ground. Yeah. He has long legs also, you know, how's he gonna get a drink or eat? Even now they gotta spread their legs to get down to get a drink, drink or eat. So that you can believe what you want, but the evidence is each animal or plant is really well designed to do what it does. I think it's amazing. God ought to get the glory for that. They don't want to give God the glory for any of that, though. No. Amen. Well said. Matt, Which actually, brother. That brings me to the next question, then. We'll ignore the fact that there aren't actually that many scientists in the world or that they've only learned evolution. But why do the critics constantly want us to agree with the consensus when it comes to who believes evolution theory uh, when they don't actually agree with consensus when it comes to belief in God? Yeah, they pick and choose the evidence that they want. Uh, they want badly to believe there is no God, and they want everybody else to believe like they believe. I bet if you did a survey in North Korea right now, all the public school teachers believe in evolution and believe in communism. All of them. Does that mean it's true, or does that mean you get your head shut, chopped off if you don't believe it's true? It's, it's censorship in, on the, in the extreme. In China, same thing. Do a survey. How many of you think communism is good? Oh, they would all say yes. They have to, or they get killed or put in prison uh, under Hitler's Germany. Do, do a survey of all the public school teachers in Nazi Germany. Do you think Hitler's a great guy? Oh, yes, wonderful guy. Do you think all the Jews should be killed? Oh, yes, they should all be killed. Sure, they, these guys going by majority opinion is so dumb. That's not how you determine truth. What is truth? The truth is cows produce cows. That's the truth. It is not true that you can, because you draw a line on paper, the cow came from an amoeba. That doesn't make it true. <laughs> now, Ken, I'm going to pretend to be the, the evolutionist here. What if they were to say, which they do say almost every single debate, because as you point out, they never learn. Well, you know, Kent, if a cow produced a non-cow, that would actually be evidence against evolution. You know, we expect cows, based on the law of monophyly, to produce cows. So therefore, you know, your argue, you, that negates your argument. Well, they have trees of life, like I have on the screen here. And this one has a horse, but it could have a cow. We've got the mammal tree. They're showing the horse, a zebra in this case, which would include the mammals, the cows, et cetera, going back to a single celled creature at the bottom, like an amoeba. So from now on, cows are gonna produce cows. That, I agree with them on that. But they think in the past, something else produced a cow. How did the amoeba turn to a cow? At some point, it was a non-cow. Somewhere back there, something non-cow produced a cow. So they do believe animals change, but we don't ever see it. Science is what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. The word science from the Latin word seer means knowledge. What do we know? What do we know by observation and testing and experimentation? We know cows produce cows. Now we know that. We've seen it many times. Do we know cows came from an amoeba? No, that's not science. So they, they'll, they'll run and hide behind that dumb statement. Well, of course, cows always produce cows. They never go out of their clay. Well, the bacteria went out of his clay, didn't he? When he turned into a cow and a human and broccoli. <laughs> they... <laughs> go ahead. No, that's a perfect response. Matt, anything to add to that, brother? Yeah, I like to remind him that um, if, if 
what they're saying is true, then go ahead and predict what anything is ever going to evolve into. Go ahead, pick anything, pick the cow. Go ahead, what's it going to evolve into? They have no predictive power because they, to them, evolution can do anything. So because it can do anything, there's no predictive power. They can't tell you anything. And if you think about um, breeding in general, it gives a good uh, overview of what we would see in the diversity of life anyway, right? Because we're doing something outside of what we see in nature, outside of selection. We take it and we take a dog and we domesticate and we breed as much as we can, but yet we see the edges of diversity, right? We get really large dogs and we get really small ones, but we don't get anything else. We don't, we're not progressing as far as what they would deem evolution to be true. We can't get anything else. Where's, where's the evolution? If we can ignore evolution, go ahead. And why don't they do it again? We got lots of laboratories in the world. Take some bacteria and make another cow. Bacteria sure. have 20, 20 minute generation time. They get born, grow up, get married, have babies in 20 minutes. A lot faster than all other animals. Okay. You ought to be able to get thousands and thousands of generations in one human lifetime. Has anybody ever seen a bacteria produce a non bacteria, let alone a cow? They can't even get out of the bacteria mode because it doesn't happen. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. It says that 20 times in the first seven chapters. I think it's because they bring forth after their kind. That's science. Amen. And, and one thing I'll add is this whole idea, this whole idea of the law of monophyly, you know, that we can never outgrow our ancestry. Um, as you've pointed out, according to the evolutionary model, an amoeba turned into a, a whale over millions to billions of years. Now, I was watching, uh, Kent, just last night, a video from Richard Dawkins, who, uh, you know, we're happy to host in a debate with you anytime. But what's that sound a chicken makes, right? <laughs> uh, so he was saying, uh, you know, creationists, they just can't conceive of deep time. You know, they will agree with micro evolutionary variations and changes. Well, if they could essentially just imagine that these micro changes were to occur over millions to billions of years, then yes, we could get a single celled like ancestor into, into a whale. So to me, it sounds like an appeal to time, but also an appeal to enough of these micro changes or variations, Kent, will equal uh, large scale evolution. What, what, what's a good response to that, brother? Well, I think there are numerous scientific ways to show you can't have billions of years. I, I'm, my, I'm just calling it up now. On my seminar part one of my creation seminar series, 50 bucks for the whole thing, 18 hours. Uh, you can, in seminar part one, I go through about 40 different scientific ways to show the earth cannot be billions of years old. It cannot be for lots of reasons. I'll just pick, pull a couple up arbitrarily here. Uh, so seminar part one, the age of the earth, the scientific answer and the biblical answer. The Bible says the earth is about 6,000 years old. And there's lots of scientific ways to demonstrate that. Let's see, this one has 1,200 slides in it. Give me just a second. But even if it was billions of years old, it's not going to help because it, um, nothing changes. In all, observe. Do it again. Make the bacteria turn into a whale. We don't see this happening. Uh, let's see, right here. Okay, a couple of quick examples. Slide number 500 and... Uh, no, slide was 501. Okay, alt DV 501. Jupiter has a moon going around it called Ganymede that has a strong magnetic field indicating a hot liquid melted molten iron core. Ah. Well, if it's billions of years old, Ganymede's A is around Jupiter, which is way out there, much further than we are from the sun. It should have lost its, it should have cooled off. Why does Ganymede still have a magnetic field? It should not have one if it's billions of years old. Ganymede, the only moon in our solar system known to have an own magnetic field, likely to have created through convection within the liquid iron core of the moon. I agree. Ganymede, the surprisingly magnetic moon. I don't have a problem with that, why it's still magnetic. 6,000 years ago, God made everything, including all the planets. So Ganymede's probably 6,000 years old. Saturn has rings going around it, but the rings are spreading out away from the planet. The rings are moving away. And Saturn is giving off infrared energy. It should have cooled off a long time ago. The vanishing rings of Saturn. Saturn's rings are moving away from the planet. Well, if it's billions of years old, why aren't they gone? You can't just keep moving away. Pretty soon, you're moved away. Duh, they don't get it. Theory about Saturn's rings is very simple. 6,000 years ago, God made everything. Saturn's only 6,000 years old. 
the moon is going around the earth. We saw it. Did you get to see the eclipse last night, brother? No, I was just That's pretty cool. We went up on the sand dune to watch the eclipse here in Lenox. You can really see it. But the moon is getting further from the earth every year. The moon is moving away. Nobody argues about that. Space Place, NASA has an article about that. I feel like we're drifting apart. Yeah, the moon is leaving us. The moon is leaving the earth uh, at about four centimeters a year. And so the moon is getting further away. Now, this is going to be complicated, but if the moon is moving away, that means it used to be closer. Well, how close can you bring the moon before that becomes a problem? Because the moon causes the tides on the earth. Bringing the moon closer, you have the inverse square law. If you brought the moon into half the distance, you take one half and inverse it and square it, it's four times the gravitational pull. Why is the moon leaving us, physics.org? The moon's orbit is indeed getting larger, 3.8 centimeters per year, inch and a half a year. Well, you brought the, if you bring the moon back, if you can go back in time, we can't. The force of gravity at one third the distance is nine times greater. They've done all kinds of studies on this and said, now wait a minute, a thousand years ago, the moon was 125 feet closer. A million years ago, 28 miles closer, not a big deal. 10 million years ago, 280 miles closer. Now we're causing a problem. 100 million, 2,000 miles closer. I think we got a problem going on here, folks. They want to be a billion years ago, 28,000 miles closer, not possible. 1.4 billion years ago, the moon would orbit would have collapsed into the Earth. This is a problem. They simply ignore it. The evolution of the lunar semi major axis represents a well known time scale problem, Astronomical Journal. It hasn't been solved in 35 years either. The moon is moving away. The evolution of the lunar semi major axis presents a well known time scale problem. The lunar orbit collapses a little over a billion years ago. Hmm. Well, I go through about 40, I think, scientific indicators like this that say, look, I'm sorry, you might need billions of years for your theory. I don't think billions of years would help turn the amoeba to a whale. But even if you had billions of years, it wouldn't work. And you can't have the billions of years. There are hundreds of scientific ways to demonstrate this planet cannot be billions of years old. If I told you this ink pen was 3,000 years old, you'd say, come on, Hovind, they didn't invent the ballpoint pen until after World War II. Oh, okay. Okay, then it's 70 years old. Oh, no, Bic wasn't even a company until 1946. You can go through, one by one, dismantle my evidence or my claim that this is 3,000 years old. I think you could limit it down to probably less than 20 years. Maybe less than five when they made this style or something. I don't know. But you'd be away. It's not, it's not 3,000. And you can claim the Earth is billions of years old, but there's all kinds of indicators to say, I'm sorry, it can't be billions of years old. You might need that, but you can't have it. If that's one of the ingredients in your recipe, sorry, you ain't baking bread today. <laughs> uh, fantastic response, uh, Ken. And e even I'd point out, based on the direct lines of evidence, the observations we have today, their claimed mechanisms to take an amoeba uh, to a whale or a single cell like ancestor to a whale is mutations and natural selection. But yet what we now know is that uh, the majority of mutations are deleterious. They're damaging and harmful to organisms, which means that reality puts shelf lives on genomes. So as you pointed out, Kent, even if they had billions of years, heck, they could have trillions of years. And yet the fact that mutations put shelf lives on genomes, you're only going to get more extinction. You're not going to get evolution. You'll get more extinction, right. nothing more. Exactly um, right. So their next response would be then, Kent, well, if, if the geologic column is, uh, you know, only ref reflection of thousands of years rather than billions of years, why do we find, you know, more simpler organisms at, at the bottom of the so-called geologic column? up to, you know, fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, eventually man at, at the top. Why don't we find, you know, a human fossil in, in, in the so-called Cambrian layers? Isn't this reflective of deep time evolutionary change? Well, I point out in my seminar part four, this is my PowerPoint, the front slide where I tell where all the slides are. The numbers have changed, so I can't quite quickly go to it now, but uh, the, there's no such thing as a geologic column. The Earth has many layers. Now, that's true. I've been all over, been to, let's see, how many, 37 countries I've been to in all 50 states many times. I've seen all the major canyons in America and uh, many other places, parts of the world. I've climbed mountains and studied, I've studied taught Earth science 15 years. The Earth has many layers. All the layers are the same age, all of them. I take this little sand toy, flip it over, and it's going to make 10 or 15 layers in a matter of a few minutes. 
They say the top layer is younger. I say, stop, stop, stop. If the top layer is younger, where is it coming from? Outer space? There is no such thing as a geologic column. Every speck of dirt on the Earth is the same age, whether it's 6,000 or 6 trillion, it's the same age. Moving it from here to here does not change the age of it, okay? So first place, there is no geologic column. There is no evidence that the layers are different ages. If I shuffle a deck of cards, does the top card become younger? Let's see, shuffle the cards, and all of a sudden, poof, that's the youngest card. No, they're all the same age. So there's no geologic column. Um, all the layers are the same age, and all over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, connecting all those layers. I got a bunch of pictures in here. Let's see, index fossils. Wow, look at this. How many layers did we make there in about three minutes? I don't know if you can see them there. Probably got uh, 20 or 30. Yeah, this one's 14 million years old. This one's 18 million. That one's 26 million. This one way at the bottom is 300 million years old. Finding fossils in different layers is only is logical. Their fossils are going to automatically be sorted in a flood based upon their, ha their, their, their habitat. Where do they live? I'd be willing to bet clams are found at the bottom because they're already at the bottom when the flood starts. That's where they live. Of course, they're the first ones buried. Duh. Birds would be found on top because they're the last ones to die in a flood. They can fly around till they run out of gas, and when they die, they float because they got hollow feathers. I bet they're sorted a little bit based upon mobility. Clams can't run very fast. I bet they're sorted based upon body density. Clam shells are heavier than bird feathers. I bet they're sorted based upon intelligence. Clams aren't too bright. Humans would be, tend to be found in the top layers because humans are a little smarter than clams, and they'd figure out a way to avoid drowning until the last minute. You know, throw together a raft or something, might survive a few weeks. Okay, they're still going to die, and they're going to be buried and end up on top. It's got nothing to do with when they lived. That is so dumb, so dumb. Tell them I said so. <laughs> I think um, many of the atheists in the, in the live chat right now are, <laughs> are, are loving it. So um, before we get to some audience questions, Let's let's move to, um, you know, now that we've addressed homology, we've addressed uh, nested hierarchies, the geologic column and appeal to deep time as if that's going to save them. We now know it's not um, a line of evidence, uh, Dr. Hoven, that they've been bringing up. It seems now for 30 years and still are is the so-called whale vestigial pelvis that they'll say is evidence for walking whales in the past and then they have these series of, of so-called transitions you know going from pachycetus to ambulocetus to rhodocetus basilosaurus all the these so-called fossil examples um so are are these structures that that we're seeing uh dr diner are these really the ancient leftover remnants of hind legs when whales were walking on land okay uh let's see Oh, the V 1649 vestigial structures from the uh, American heritage science dictionary whales, for example, have small bones located in the muscles of their body walls that are vestigial bones of hips and hind limbs. Hmm. Biology textbook. Many organisms retain traces of their evolutionary history. For example, the whale retains pelvic and leg bones as useless vestiges. Jeannie Scott at the National Center for Science Mis Miseducation in Berserkley, California. She said they their, their, their goal is to keep guys like me out of the schools. I debated Jeannie once. I'll do it again anytime, Jeannie, anytime. Bring it on, okay? At their uh, Berserkley headquarters, they say National Center for Science Miseducation. Uh, one of their evidences is about whales evolving. This is, this is one of the main evidences always used. Whales have a vestigial pelvis and leg bone that serve no purpose, this biology textbook says. Modern whales have hind limbs which have reduced to only a few tiny internal hind limb bones that have no function. Hmm. Just imagine whales walking around. Here it is at, uh, at Los Angeles Museum of Natural History. They got a whole skeleton of a whale and there are the so-called hip bones and leg bones of the whale, the whale's pelvis. This is so dumb to call that a pelvis, okay? That has nothing to do with walking on land. And you atheists are desperate and completely ignorant of your whale anatomy, okay? There's a humpback whale in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Look at that, the hip bones. That's not a hip bone. It's part of the whale's reproductive system. 
National Pornographic for Kids. Millions of years ago, dolphins had legs. They do this on all of these shows. The whale's pelvis, far from the vertebra, has no apparent function. We have one of the bones in our museum. These are one of the bones from a whale. Anybody from Alaska that hits, you know, finds a beached whale dead, rot away, send us more. We'd like a bunch more for our science. Send the whole skeleton down here. We'll reassemble it and put it up in our science center. It had, this bone has a blood supply, a nerve supply. It's an active part of the whale's reproductive system. The whales have to mate underwater in the dark with no arms, and they can't talk and say, screw it over, honey. The whale has a 15-foot-long penis that he has to maneuver around in the dark and find where it goes, okay? There's muscles attached to those bones. If you think those, those bones are vestigial, you can believe that if you want, but I'm telling you what, you go take him out of a whale, he's going to be really mad at you, okay? Don't do that, okay? They need those bones and those muscles to make baby whales. has nothing to do with walking on land. Even still... All we've ever observed is whales produce whales. Nobody's ever seen that. And even if it was the whale losing its leg bone, that's losing, not gaining. Where's the evidence of any animal gaining anything? What bones are found? It's three, three individuals found. Okay. So the male and female whales are different, like male and female of just about everything is different. They have to mate, as I said, in the dark underwater, the erotic endurance of whale hips. Those aren't hips, but they're so desperate to not believe they're designed for what they do, they'll believe anything. Carl Zimmer talks about the whale hips. Um, this is absolutely dumb. I'm sorry. They are either lying or they're stupid about their whale anatomy. Tell them I said so. I'll debate them all at the same time. <laughs> Another great answer. And um, Dr. Dino, correct me if I'm wrong. The majority, if not all, of, of the so-called vestigial organs, like the whale, you know, quote unquote pelvis, the appendix, the coccyx, uh, where there was once 140 at least uh, so-called useless structures and in, in organs, we now know that the majority of them have have function. They're not evidence for for common ancestry. I think it's they're all gone off the list. Back in the 1860s, 70s, when they were desperate for evidence for Darwin's new book, they had, I think it was 140 or 50 vestigial structures. Oh, look, you don't need your tonsils. They're vestigial. Well, now they know you have a use for the tonsils. They say, oh, the wisdom teeth, that's vestigial. Well, again, that's losing, not gaining. But that's evidence that man was probably bigger in the past. And by the time you're 16 or 18, you need that last tooth to come in because your jaw is still growing. Not evidence for evolution. It's evidence man used to be bigger. I'm not aware of any vestigial structures anywhere in the world. If you know of some, let me know. I'll do some research on it and counter it. But the whale does not have a vestigial pelvis. Awesome. Well, you know, that's a good um, way that we can move into uh, one final argument that I've seen them, them use over and over again now, especially over the last five months. And it, it kind of pertains to this um, idea of useless structures, except now in the realm of genetics. They've taken this idea that's been overturned with, with vestigial structures and they've now applied it to the genomes of living organisms, where they look to these uh, interesting sequences of DNA called endogenous retroviral-like DNA. And uh, because we share these ERV elements with uh, the chimpanzees and essentially all vertebrates at least, uh, demonstrates common ancestry. They'll say that these are the ancient remnants of uh, viral infections in the past that have been acquired, passed down vertically, and therefore that's why we share them in the same positions, let's say between humans and, and chimpanzees. So the question uh, comes down to Dr. Dino, um, does the existence of endogenous retroviruses provide evidence for common descent? Absolutely not. Uh First place, any, they're not uh, um, unnecessary. They're part of the gene code, okay? They're you. How much of the human genome is retroviral sequences? Human endogenous retroviruses, ERV, HERV, are DNA sequences within human chromosomes. They comprise up to 8%. The gene code of a single human is more complex than the whole computer system of the world. Uh, it's unbelievable the complexity of the gene code. They said if you took one person's DNA out of their body, you have 100 trillion cells. Each one contains 46 of these chromosomes, except for the gametes, they got 23. Okay. If you took each one, if you unwound it and wrapped, unwound it, it would be six feet long. So if you unwound every DNA from one person, 
and tied, unwound them and tied them together, you'd have enough DNA to go from here to the moon and back, I think, 500 times or something like that. Take six feet for each one times 46 times 100 trillion. That's how many feet long it would be. And they think it happened by chance. That's the code to make you. King David said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He didn't even have a microscope and he could figure it out. You'd think these guys with a microscope would really be saying, wow, God, you're smart. I mean, when you study a really cool invention, I bet if somebody found this and took it apart and studied it, said, man, that's a little microphone. It takes a signal, it amplifies it, sends it through the radio waves. It's chargeable, you can plug it in. That's pretty amazing. I bet somebody made this. I bet they did. I don't know who, I don't know where, and I don't care. I bet somebody made it. I think it's common sense to look at one single cell in your body and say, wow, God, you're amazing. I don't have a problem doing that. Why do they, why can't they do it? I don't know. But retroviruses are not uh, evidence for evolution. Back in 2008, they proved they're necessary, they're needed. Our analysis revealed the retroviral sequence in human gene code, tens of thousands of active promoters transcribed ERV sequence corresponding to 1.16% of the human genome. Let's see, these data suggest ERVs may regulate human transcription on a large scale. Oh, we need them. They're not, they're not, uh, we're not losing them. They're not vestigial. So anybody that thinks ERVs are evidence for evolution is way behind on their research. Beneficial function of ERVs in the immune response. That's how you can be immune to certain things. When diseases come around. This is back in 2014. So they've known this for eight years now. Get up to speed, guys. They play a critical role in the body's immune defense. Switching sides, endogenous retroviruses protect us from viral infections. May last year, they said, wow, we need them. We need these things. They're not long regarded as junk DNA. ERVs have turned out to represent uh, important components of the antiviral human response, immune response. So you need to get up to speed on this. They're not evidence for evolution. Somebody who doesn't know much might say, oh, look, we got evidence for evolution with ERVs, and they throw that word out. And then they move on to something else. No, sorry, stop. That's not evidence. What else do you got? Go ahead. Great answer. Great answer, Kent. Spot on. And what I find interesting, because um, one of their follow-up questions would be, well, why do these uh, you know, ERV sequences that, that you guys say are created units of DNA function rather than the ancient remnants of, of past viral infections? They'll say, why do they resemble... Uh, exogenous retroviruses, like HIV is an example of, of a, an extant uh, retrovirus. But you pointed to a technical paper there, uh, Kent, that's one of my favorites, that has to do with uh, how they act as antiviral protectors. And if you study the literature, it actually turns out that these ERV elements, they require these similarities to these uh, extant retroviruses in order to do their jobs, because they do their jobs through something called viral mimicry. Again, more evidence for design, not evidence for a common ancestry. Pretty smart. Guerrilla warfare. Send the guys in behind the enemy lines. Make them look like the enemy. Sneak in there. We're designed at every level, Amen. micro and macro level. Amen, brother. Spot on, spot on. Okay, so the last point I'll bring up before we get to these audience questions, as we will try and wrap up around the hour mark. Um, this paper that I put on screen, uh, Dr. Hoven, you, um, an argument you utilized over the last couple of weeks was um, similar to the ERV argument in uh, what's called ALU or ALU sequency. So it's the same thing. They'll try and say that, that these are uh, remnants of parasites or, or invasions over millions of years. And then they'll say that, that these are functionless as well. These are junk. Um, you know, what would be your response to it? And, and I've got a paper here just for the audience sake, too, where it says right in this uh, technical article, peer reviewed publication, the ALU DNA sequences, which are mobile within our genome, regulate the activity of ribosomes and contribute again, Dr. Dona, as, as you were pointing out earlier with the ERV sequences, to the cell's immunity. So are these really junk like the evolutionists are saying? Yeah, I don't have slides ready for that, but you're correct. It's the same thing. They're, it's, it, they don't, they're, they're designed. They're amazingly complex, and they're designed. I bet if you put a six-year-old under the hood of your car and said, take out anything it doesn't need, he probably doesn't know what 80% of it does. What do you need that for? Take it out. 
Just because you don't know what it's for doesn't mean you don't need it. Put a six-year-old in front of the uh, dashboard of your car and say, what are all these buttons for? I don't know. Does that mean the buttons don't do anything? No, you just don't know yet. You're only six. Well, our scientists, I think, are only six when it comes to studying this kind of stuff. They're, every time they really get into it, they say, oh, we do need that. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well said. We are just in the infancy of understanding the DNA language. Um, Matt, anything you want to add, brother, before we start uh, digging into these audience questions? Go ahead. Uh, no, we better jump into it, man. We're running out of time. It's just going so fast. Okay, let me go right to um, right to the beginning. There's here's one that comes in from Viram Argumentum. So I'll put it up on screen. Viram Argumentum, I appreciate it. Uh, so he's got an interesting question here. He says, uh, "Question for Kent: Could the Adam of the Bible have been a Homo Heidelbergensis, like William Lane Craig suggests in his book?" There's a newer book that that has come out from a theistic evolutionist who claims Adam may have looked like Homo Heidelbergensis. Do you have any um, opinions on this, Dr. Hoven? I don't know what Homo Heidelbergensis looked like. Uh, I don't know what Adam looked like, okay? That would be pure guesswork, and I don't know much about William Lane Craig. Uh, so, sorry, I can't help on that. But I think God created Adam and Eve full grown, fully mature. He was a man and a woman, not an egg and a sperm in the garden. they got to find each other, and where would they grow? And I think, if they, so there would be an appearance of age. Automatically, it's just necessary to make it work. I think the plants were already full grown. God didn't make Adam and hand him a package of seeds and say, plant these quick. No, it has to be already plants with trees with fruit growing on them. So a mature creation, the moment it was created, a fully functioning, mature, fully grown creation is the only way it's going to work. Now, then I think Adam lived nearly nine, no, 930 years after that. We know that there are certain parts of your body that never stop growing. Your masseter muscle, when you chew, is constantly pulling on all the other face muscles and bones. And it makes your eyebrow ridges grow bigger. Over, if somebody could live to be three or four hundred years old, they'd get a much bigger brow ridge. What does that prove? It proves they're old. It doesn't prove they're part monkey. So if you see these Neanderthals that got the brow ridge sticking out, they say, oh, see, that's proof because we're related to an ape. No, it's proof somebody's living to be more than three or four hundred years old. And when you bend your head down and lift it up over and over, the muscles at the back of your neck are constantly pulling on the back of your skull, and gradually your skull will get elongated. And again, after two or three or four or five hundred years, you'd have a longer head, bigger brain. And some of these so-called cavemen that they talk about had larger brains than we do. Well, duh. Yeah, <laughs> they probably really did. And they get a longer head, so they get room for their uh, white wisdom teeth to come in. We are a fallen creature in a fallen world, whereas Adam was a perfect creature in a perfect world. So it was very, very different. Nothing to do with being a caveman. So all the caveman stuff is covered on video number two of my series uh, about the Garden of Eden. Why did they live to be 900? Garden of Eden, part two. And where did the cavemen fit in? There's people today that live in caves. There have always been people that live in caves. Have you seen Castaway? Didn't he live in a cave? Uh, was he a caveman? No. So... <laughs> Uh, well, I guess he was a caveman, yeah, for, for a while. Go ahead. Well, that's uh, some very interesting points, uh, Ken. Here's something to consider, too, is if we have our uh, biblical patriarchs, like these Neanderthals living uh, hundreds of years, um, we actually know that, that for a man, man's reproductive cells start dividing at puberty, and then they don't actually stop dividing in, until they die. So older men can actually have children later in life. So if we actually have our, our older biblical patriarchs having kids at, at um, older ages, that means they've accumulated more mutations, especially in the Y chromosome, that they've passed on to their children. And this is a concept uh, in the creationist world called uh, patriarchal drive. And I, I bring this up because a lot of evolutionists, uh, Dr. Dino, they'll try and say, well, you know, we have sequenced portions of the Neanderthal genome and their genetics are a lot different than us today, modern humans. But when you consider this fact that Neanderthals would be harboring more mutations and therefore passing on more, their offspring are going to be genetically different than, let's say, modern humans, humans today. So that's just a point I wanted to bring up. Do you have any thoughts on that? Ken? No, that's good. Thank you. No, no problem. Uh, Matt. 
I'll hand it over to you, brother. What, what, what do you want to ask next out of these questions? Um, I saw you wrote down a question, but I don't see a question in it. So I'm going to read it off anyway, and then you can just make a statement. <laughs> it says, um, from seven Tibets, standing for truth. Before the flood, the world was very corrupted. This means the kinds were also corrupted. We have no idea how radically different the animals may have looked. It's just a statement. Uh, if you want to comment on that. I put that up on screen. Okay. So he, he, he might, whoops, I'm going to unmute Cap. Cap, you're good, brother. Well, I, how does this person know that the animals were corrupted and the kinds were corrupted? God said in 10, 20 times in the first seven chapters, they will bring forth after their kind. Squirrels make baby squirrels. Dogs make baby dogs. There are no exceptions that we've ever seen. So why would he think? I think that the varieties uh, would have been pretty incredible. God designed each creature to produce a variety of offspring so they can survive in different climates. Dogs can produce puppies. <clears throat> and if you turned them all loose in Alaska, only the ones with thicker fur would survive, like the wolf or the coyote or the um, uh, um, thick fur dog. Uh, anyway. Newfoundland. Newfoundland. Okay. Then if you turned all the same dogs loose in the desert, the thick fur now is a disadvantage. So those with less hair or shorter hair or longer legs would survive. Nature would select different types, body types to survive, depending upon just the temperature, depending upon food supply. There'd be a lot of factors involved here, but it's still the same kind. So I don't know that we, the question may be invalid. We don't know that it was different, wildly different kinds before the flood. Noah took two of each kind on the ark, probably babies. I think he took two of each, I think there's probably maybe 10 or 15 different varieties of dinosaurs. You could classify them into 10 or 15 different categories if you wanted to. They're probably, well, there's a website called barominology.com. Baramin is the Hebrew word for kind. Uh, barominology.com has done lots of study on this. They say there's about 8,000 kinds of animals that had to go on the ark. 8,000 kinds, 16,000 animals, seven of some. So say 20,000 animals on a boat that size is not a problem if he brought babies, which is common sense. Babies eat less, they poop less, they sleep a lot more and they're lighter and smaller. And after you get off the ark, they're gonna live longer to produce more babies and that's why you're bringing them. So it'd be common sense to bring babies of everything on the ark. So I, don't, I think the question may be invalid. I don't think you could prove that there were a lot of uh, wild variations, uh, certainly not any evolution before the flood or after the flood. Dogs are still producing dogs, always have. Appreciate it, Kent. Uh, here's a super chat that comes in from Jerome M. Just showing some appreciation. He says, Kent's the man with the plan. So we would agree with that, brother. You are the man with the plan. Probably many plans, I'm sure. <laughs> Actually, our dinosaur adventure land down here, we don't have a plan. I tell people what I do, I eat a lot of pizza with peanut butter on it before I go to bed. And you wake up at two in the morning with wild ideas. That's how I got my daughter. That's a different story. But uh, so there's really not a plan. We just... <laughs> Get these ideas, have our staff meeting. Hey, let's do this. Oh, hey, good idea. Okay. Come on down to the place. It is, it is really amazing. Hide the peanut butter, they say down here. Yeah. Hide the peanut butter. I'm going to try that, Kat, because it's obviously working. So okay. oh, that's, the, that's some good advice. So here's an interesting question that comes in. Very lively and engaged chat. So um, let's see, we'll kind of break this down. Flooded area 3261 says, how do you explain genes that have no effect on phenotype? So the, the, the outward appearance, what the creature looks like, such as cellular respiration are more alike in species that are most morphologically similar, like humans and, and chimpanzees. So if I'm interpreting this question correctly, there, there's certain genes um, housekeeping genes that have like one function, the evolutionists will say, like ATP synthase proteins or cytochrome C. So the evolutionists will oftentimes say, you know, if, if this certain gene has one function, let's say in cellular respiration, why does this gene look different between humans and chimpanzees? Why didn't God make these kinds of genes just looking exactly the same since they have the same function? Hmm. Don't know. You have to ask him when I get to heaven. Or if you're not up there, I'll ask him and try to get the message down to you wherever you are at that time. So uh, <laughs> that, I would be willing to bet if you go, if I'm in my PowerPoint program and I go to spell check, it probably takes me to a, thousands and thousands of lines of code to check spelling in a document. 
I bet if I went in Microsoft Word and clicked spell check, it would take me to the identical lines of code because it's doing the same thing. It's checking the spelling. So the fact that there are similar lines of code or different lines of code, there may be something has to be different in order to check spelling in a document than spelling in a picture, like PowerPoint. I don't know. So there may be some differences in the lines of code. It still doesn't prove and nobody designed the lines of code. I think the DNA is so complicated, whether it's similar or different. It's complicated. It had a designer. How can anybody not see that? I don't know. No, I, th I think you nailed it, Kent. If you think about it, it's kind of, I mean, to me, it's kind of an absurd question from the evolutionist. I'm, I'm not saying specifically this individual, but an argument because information flow or cell optimization would be expected to be slightly different between humans and chimpanzees. So why would we expect the, these genes, although the same function, they're still going to function differently in terms of information flow. I mean, there are differences in, in the chimpanzee than, uh, you know, with, with the human. So to expect God to just create them identical, um, you know, I, I wouldn't personally expect that. Matt, any oh. thoughts from you, brother? Yeah, that's also assuming that that's the only function of that gene. So if we look inside of the mitochondria and there's 37 genes and one of them in particular is called the CO1 gene, its primary function is cellular respiration, exactly what he's talking about. But what happens is if we look in there and we find the exact same alleles and we mutate them in the chimpanzee and we mutate the same one in the human, there's different negative results that come from it. So obviously the secondary function is what makes it different. And that's probably why it looks different. So, it, yeah, its primary function is cellular respiration, but that doesn't mean it's the only function that's being processed there. And uh, when we look inside these genes, I mean, if you really want to get into it, we can look at the mitochondria and what do we see? We don't we don't see saturation of mutations when we look in the region itself. If deep time was true, saturation of these these areas would be extremely fast because the mutation rate is fast. And if we look inside that CO1 gene like this, well, guess what? It's one of the fastest mutating genes in the mitochondria. So mutations are happening so quickly. If deep time was true, these regions would be completely saturated with mutations, but they're not there. That's why evolution had to invent a genetic bottleneck. We didn't have to invent it. It's already there in scripture. It says there was a global flood. They said deep time would have erased all genetic similarity. So it was a falsification on their part. And we're the ones that predicted there would be genetic similarity. So it's funny that they use that as evidence when it's actually evidence for us. <laughs> Interesting points. Interesting points. I think it goes back to what Kent said earlier. We are like a five-year-old looking under the hood of a car trying to figure out what's going on. There's so much in the DNA that we just, it's, it's science fiction on, on the molecular level. Um, Dr. Diner, here's the next question comes in from Dave. Dave, I appreciate it. He says, um, I got it up on screen. Isn't dog breeding a great example of the limits of the genome? When breeders go to extremes, it seems most times the dogs are quite problematic because their organs are not appropriate. And he's just asking for your thoughts on that. That's exactly correct. I mean, dog, they, people have been breeding dogs for a long time, trying to get their smaller ones or faster ones for greyhound racing and stuff like that. I think they've probably come very close to reaching a limit in size. I tell people, you know, they've been crossbreeding dogs, trying to get bigger ones. They now got the Great Dane or what's their bigger Mastiff. Do you think they'll ever get a dog as big as Texas? No, there's a limit. Whether they reached it or not is we can argue about, but I bet they're getting close to the limit. I think they've reached a breeding limit on the speed for horses. They're just, that's, they've got about reached the limit. I think they've reached a limit on the size of dogs when it comes to small dogs. They now have the toy Chihuahua wouldn't last 10 minutes in the woods, the squirrels would eat it, okay? It, 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 so it might be beneficial for humans who want to cuddle one on their lap, but it's not beneficial for, for the dog. And so, and it's man-made. Nature would select a more generic middle of the road type to survive, and that might vary from climate to climate. Alaska would have a different type of dog selected by nature than the desert would, but they're still a dog, still interfertile technically. So what we, we never see any animal produce outside of its kind. That's what God said would happen. That's all that's ever happened. Great points, Ken. So would this be a, a way we can answer this question where the evolutionists constantly say, you know, how can you get all the millions of species today from just, uh, you know, a few thousand um, archetypes on, on the ark or even uh, at creation? Because you oftentimes point out 
that uh, the original created kinds would be front loaded or created with uh, design diversity that can help them adapt in, in different situations as, as you're pointing to. So, I mean, is, is that really evolution if these changes are already built into the system to help them adapt in the first place? Yeah, we see limits to these changes and it's, it, it's already built in. They've been trying to breed faster horses for a long time. Well, breed wings onto the horse and fly around the track. You know, there, there's, there, there's a limit and it's, it's, they're dealing with information already present. You could probably select people to breed until you had all blondes in one place or all redheads or all brown hair, whatever. You could pick a trait and, and, and breed for that. Sure. But that's, you're going to get something that's already existing in the gene code. There's a variety of squirrels. Might have had a common ancestor, a squirrel. It doesn't prove you can go make all the squirrels related to all the fish. I go back to an amoeba. This is, God said they'll bring forth after their kind. It's all we've ever seen. If you can put the original question back up, there was something else I wanted to say about that. Rather, oh, Absolutely, yeah. That was, I believe this was the question from Dave. Oh man, the chat is moving fast, but I'll find it, brother. Um, here it is. Isn't dog breeding an example of the limits of the genome? When breeders go to extremes, it seems most times the dogs are quite problematic because their organs are not appropriate. That is correct. There are lots of problems with these exotic breeds. Uh, many of them are, are retarded, okay? They're just plain dumb. There's no, way to, no kind way to say it. Your dog is dumb, ma'am, okay? You did get your toy chihuahua and it's an idiot. So, okay, and there are problems with, as you said, the organs uh, don't fit together. They don't function right. And they certainly wouldn't survive in the wild on their own. You got to babysit them now until they die. And I think you'll find lower life expectancy in many of them and um, health problems. Okay. Uh, they just, it's not normal. It's not natural. So yeah, the, the question is good. And I think Dave, you're right on target. Um, it's problematic when they do this. Appreciate it, Dr. Hoven. Uh, here's a, a super chat comes in from George Bond. He's he's the Australian that uh, works for our ministry here, and he wants to he wants to buy you some pizza. He says pizza for Dr. Hoven with pineapple, of course. So I don't know if you like pineapple or not. Okay, so there you I go. Love it. <laughs> Bravo. Okay, brother, I want to respect your time, so we're going to get the last two questions here that have come in uh, from the audience, and I'll get this one up on screen. This one comes in from Anthony. Anthony, thank you for your question. So he asks, why do evolutionists keep saying a dog, and we did discuss this a little bit earlier, will always be a dog when they believe everything came from a single cell suit? Do they not understand their own beliefs? They, they do not understand that they are completely violating their own belief. The family tree show everything going back to an amoeba. The amoeba is not a dog. So it's true that dogs always produce dogs, but how did the amoeba produce something that was non-amoeba? This is pure imagination. Appreciate it, Kent. And here's here's the last question. Uh, brother, this has been a ton of fun. Anybody who's just getting in here, because uh, I know we got over uh, 200 people and they're saying they just arrived. Make sure you watch this from the beginning when it's over. We touched on a ton, uh, vestigial organs, ERVs, homology, nested hierarchies, just a couple that come to mind. So please check it out. Share this around as well. The truth is important. So Stephen asks a uh, question for Kent. Is it possible viruses, because we know most of them are, are beneficial, come from the DNA instead of being inserted in from the outside? And the diseased ones, the ones that cause disease, are mutated viruses, not working according to God's original design. Excellent question. I don't know a simple answer to that one. Uh, the, maybe they serve a beneficial function. Uh, yeah, I have to work on that one for a while, do some research, but the good question. Don't have a quick answer. That's definitely a good question. Um, Matt, anything you want to add? Any any last question you want to ask before we, we wind it up, wind it down, I should say? Yeah, um, it might be a little out of left field here, but I, I, I threw this question in myself earlier. I wanted to know what Ken's perspective was regarding what is going to be the cause of the great falling away in the end of days for believers. Do you have any... Idea. Um, it would take two hours to answer all that. In my book, I wrote What on Earth is About to Happen and my video series, you know, What on Earth is About to Happen. I said that I think the tribulation is going to start in 2021 
and I think it probably did. My video series covers this a lot. People are going to fall away by the millions and quit serving God. Things are going to get rough, okay? Uh, the uh, Luke 18, 8, Jesus said, When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Is he going to find anybody uh, alive on the earth serving him when he comes? I think the rapture <clears throat> is going to almost be a non-event, kind of like uh, the flood. How many got on that boat? Eight. Where's everybody else? Door was open for 600 or you know, a couple hundred years. Nobody came. So I think most Christians are going to be killed for their faith. They're being killed right now by the thousands in, around the world. And many are going to simply fall away. Uh, I think the, the New World Order type folks have a big plan. You know, how big was the first telephone? The first... Um, about the size of, of, uh, and all it did was very simple functions. I'm going to put together a graph or a chart. Maybe someone you would like to do that. Send it to me. The communication devices. In order to do what this thing does right here, 80 years ago, how big would it have to be? It would be a whole room full of stuff, right? I think the goal is to reduce this down even smaller and smaller and smaller and get it to where you have a little tiny chip in your forehead or in your hand where you touch the chip, hello, call Jimmy for me, please. And I think that uh, Elon Musk and all these guys would like all of the humans in the world to be part of one big brain, where everybody's got this chip and we all are one organism. You get to be like God. So the memory can be, so I could just simply access your memory. That's what they want, okay? And they keep micro-sizing things smaller and smaller, so... Many are going to fall away when they say, look, if you don't get this chip in your hand or in your head, you can't buy or sell. Well, I got to eat. And they're going to submit to the, to the Antichrist. I, it's just coming like a freight train. Amen. Great answer. And I got to say, Dr. Hoven, um, you know, I, I feel bad for the pre-tribulation crowd because like you pointed out, it's coming like a freight train. <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to be it's probably here you know, by now and no, no pre-trib rapture. So your material on the post-tribulation rapture is fantastic. Well, I, I believed in the pre-trib rapture for 40 years. I mean, that's what I was taught in the Schofield Bible and my fundamental independent temperamental Baptist church taught that. And, you know, John R. Rice taught that all the people I read after and heroes of the faith. It's just not true. It was made up in 1830 by a 15 year old Scottish girl having dreams. So while I was in prison for nine years unjustly, I made this chart and read my scriptures cover to cover many times. In Matthew 24, you can read it for yourself, Jesus' the disciples asked him, Lord, when are you coming? And what's the sign we should watch for? In Mark 13, same thing. Luke 21, same thing. He, they all said, Lord, when are you coming and what's the sign? He describes the tribulation for the next 16 or 18 verses. And at the end here, he said, after the tribulation, when the sun and the moon go dark, I'm going to come gather my people after the tribulation. I, 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 I'm embarrassed. It took me 40 years to find it, but that's the simple truth of Scripture. We're here for the whole thing, and most are going to fall away. Amen. Well said. I've got your book right here, brother. I uh, highly recommend it. What on earth is about to happen for heaven's sake? And this goes back to earlier where these evolutionists like to uh, bring up the argument from majority and consensus. You pointed out, consensus has pretty well always been wrong at the time of the flood there was eight people that's it eight people and how, how many years did, did noah preach and no, nobody got on the ark except for his yeah. family so great way oh i'm sorry go ahead ken no that's it you're right brother it's, it's going uh, so I, I think the rapture is going to be probably a, a non-event there won't be many going up we'll see amen well said. Well, I appreciate your time. As always, uh, Dr. Dino, you are a huge blessing. Uh, I will give a shout out to a couple of your upcoming debates here. You've got like three or four or 20 in the next month. So uh, this week, uh, I believe it's Friday, uh, James W. and uh, Dr. Dino. 
and then we will be having uh, Ken Rock and uh, Kent. That'll be uh, first thing next week. I believe it's the 23rd for that one. And then also next week, uh, Rune Norderhog. So we've done five months of this challenge and uh, the challenge continues. So uh, Matt, thank you so much for co-hosting, brother. Uh, Ken, any final words, final thoughts before we let you get out of here? Uh, winning the debate on creation evolution is is one issue. It's pretty easy to demonstrate there's a creator, okay? But then what? So you win the debate, you convince them, okay, there's a creator. Well, that's a big then what? Now what? If there's a creator, you better find out what he wants and do what he says because he owns this place. So I'd like to encourage everybody to stop and get alone, get away from everything, shut off the TV, shut off the stupid video game, and stop and think, where are you going when you die? I would be willing to bet five bucks you're going to die. And you're going to be dead for a long time. Where are you going? Jesus Christ died on that cross and rose from the dead. He'd like to forgive your sins and come live in your heart and make you one of his children. 53 years ago, I asked him to become my Lord and Savior. He moved in, started rearranging the furniture, and he's still rearranging the furniture, changing a bunch of stuff. But he's in there, and I want him to be the boss. I want to follow him, and you ought to get him in your heart too. If you're not sure you're going to heaven, if you're not sure you're saved and you'd like to talk about it, off the record if you'd like, call 855-BIG-DINO, extension 3. I take calls all day and half the night. When I get tired, I shut it off. Call me tomorrow. But I'll be glad to lead you to the Lord right over the phone, explain what you got to do. 855-BIG-DINO, that's 244-3466, hit extension 3. If you want to order our materials, hit extension 1, and we'll be glad to get you some of that stuff. Our website, Dr. Dino. Dot com, D-R-D-I-N-O. Thanks for having me. Let's do it again sometime. Awesome, brother. I appreciate it. And Matt and I, we're going to stick around for a bit. We have some announcements and reminders. Uh, Dr. Dino, you go get some uh, well-deserved rest and sleep. God bless you. We'll see you later this week. All right. Thank you, brother. All right, there we go. Hour and 15 minutes really does fly by. And uh, that was fast paced. I mean, most of that was off the cuff. Uh, you and I, Matt, we've been engaging these guys forever now. Kent, obviously, forever. We've done so many debates. So we know all their arguments, uh, you know, uh, at the top of our head. And, you know, it, it's fun bringing them forth and uh, just having some fun with, you know, Dr. Dino here addressing uh, the evolutionist favorite arguments. I mean, we touched on in the last hour and 15 minutes vestigial organs, including the whale <laughs> pelvis, walking whales. Um, which unfortunately some uh, creationist camps actually look to the vestigial, so-called vestigial pelvis, as evidence that there was like a walking whale archetype on the ark. I mean, to me, that's that's a little bizarre. We understand that the, <laughs> these structures are there and connected to, to some important uh, muscles for functional purposes. So no need to invoke <laughs> walking whales on the ark. Um, anyway, that's just a rabbit trail. We touched on ERVs. Uh, we touched on ELU sequences. We touched on uh, nested hierarchies, homology, uh, nested hierarchies, even in these um, highly conserved uh, proteins and uh, DNA elements like cytochrome C, you know, um, so the, the age of the earth. We touched on a ton. So if you're just getting here in the chat, uh, please make sure that you are... Uh, flipping back at some point and watching the whole show. So me and Matt do want to announce, I've got the endogenous retrovirus handbook right here, dismantling the best evidence for evolution, guys. So this is uh, the final version that is, this is more so the proof copy just for me to make sure that everything is good. Um, so it is 171 pages and I recommend it for everybody. 171 pages, the most comprehensive and, and up-to-date and technical, but also written for the layperson to understand as well, uh, a response to endogenous retroviruses. So um, I, I find it fascinating, Matt, brother. I'm curious your thoughts. What turns out um, after examining the, the so-called best evidence for common descent, ERVs, uh, it turns out that it, ERV sequences are actually some of the best evidence and confirmation for, for critical thinking. Um, have you noticed that as well, uh, Matt? 
Yeah, well, it was like digging into genetic similarity, right? Genetic similarity has been used by evolutionists for quite some time as the absolute best unequivocal evidence for evolution. Then when you realize that in 1965, it was actually predicted by evolutionists that there would be no genetic similarity because evolution would have erased genetic similarity over deep time. So what we see is how come all of these different regions have so much similarity and how could they if mutation rates are so fast? They can't have one and without the other, right? So you can't have ERVs that have all these similarities and have beneficial functions and then at the same time claim that, oh, well, you know, the, yeah, their mutation rates fast, but they've existed in us for millions of years. You can't have both. <laughs> it's just not the way it works. So uh, they never predicted beneficial functions. They were part of junk DNA, which were considered 99.9% .9 worthless. Yet what do we see? All the harmful things that come from ERVs come from the mutation in the ERVs, not the virus itself. So great point. And here's the thing. A lot of evolutionists, they're, they're out of date on the technical literature. So you'll find in this book um, pages and pages and pages worth of uh, references to the scientific literature, the primary source data, uh, refuting ERVs and showing function after function. I've got papers from 2022 in here. I've also got a comprehensive section on ALU sequences. I answer exactly why there are nested hierarchies in the so-called mutations within the ERV elements. Um, you know, I address this idea of fixed versus unfixed endogenous retroviral sequences. So uh, again, guys, and I, I did just look, we've also got a full color version. So um, it says updates in review, our, our final, uh, the, the final updates after proofreading it. And um, my guess is it'll be available both, both versions probably in the next several hours. So anybody in the chat, please um, check the description box of this video sometime in the next eight hours. When the book is available, I will put it in the description box, guys, because I highly encourage you to click the link. Um, you know, it, it, it's very affordable because we do want just as many people as possible to get a hold of this book because it's a huge game changer. It absolutely dismantles um, common descent. And it, it confirms biblical creation. It, it shows that from the biblical creation starting point, we can much better explain um, the existence of endogenous retroviral like sequences. So also stay tuned. I'll leave a community post um, as well the second that it's updated, because I do want to make sure everybody gets the, the fully updated version. So uh, while we were over the last week uh, proofreading, and making sure the book is good to go for uh, this week. Um, I guess a, a couple people must have stumbled upon upon it before it was uh, fully good to go. So anybody who has ordered a copy before, let's say today, um, you know, you're not going to have the final version. You're going to have the author copy that that we utilize to make sure everything's good to go, covers lined up. So I don't know if, if you're in the chat, whoever it is, shoot me an email and I'll, I'll send you a free uh, PDF or ebook. So you have the most up to date uh, version, uh, especially if you're a critic who, who wants to address the arguments in this book. We want to make sure that, that you have uh, the, the full, the full book. So uh, Matt, over to you, brother. Um, I've noticed you've got, you've got some slides too. And anything you want to kind of touch on uh, in the next few minutes? Uh, sure. Um, I'll, we'll go down the list because when I started seeing questions and comments coming in, I stopped the chat from going. So the first one, don't get tattoos. I can attest to that. And <laughs> not because you're probably going to change your mind. It's, pro it's also because they slowly toxify the system by dropping heavy metals into the system. That's why after you get a tattoo that's fresh, your body usually breaks out. That's from them dumping the toxic chemicals into the lymphatic system and trying to get out of your system. That's why you break out in acne and things. So yeah, they're not the best. <laughs> Another one is standing for truth. I really wish you guys would contact Alex Jones. He's right about so many things, but thinks evolution is real. Well, uh, <laughs> could you imagine we have Alex Jones on and the next day whole channel shut down? <laughs> shut down for the first thing he says. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Ministry done. Oh, that's yeah. funny. Um, well, I, I was going to say, yeah, uh, you know, you and I both have tattoos, but these are from my, my pre-Christian days. So uh, I haven't gotten any more tattoos since uh, I've understood. Probably not a good reason. Uh also because of the health reasons, as you just pointed out, Matt. Very interesting, brother. 
Yeah, yeah, uh, we were. Yeah, people think like we are young Earth creationists can't think outside of the box, can't can't even fathom evolution. It's like, man, I've watched every series of Ancient Aliens. We believed in evolution. <laughs> we weren't raised this way. <laughs> we're as open minded as you can get. It's just crazy. But uh, I saw that comment regarding radiometric dating, asking why we don't use it. Is actually uh, Matt be, because that's such an important topic. Let me address this real quick, and then and sure. then you go off on radiometric dating. I love it. So uh, Stephen Tibets, Amen. You know, there's a difference between tribulation, what the world does to us, and um, or what Satan does to us, and wrath. Right. We are not appointed under wrath. That's a lot of times what pre-tribulation advocates uh, would point to. And, uh, you know, eschatology, let's be real. It, it should be an, um, a non-divisive issue. Right. It's not like a fellowship breaking issue. Although I think it's pretty clear that, that the Bible teaches a post-tribulation rapture because it says after the tribulation, but Mark 13, uh, Matthew 24, Luke 21, all correlate on what? You know, Jesus coming in the clouds to gather together his elect after the tribulation of those days when the sun is darkened, the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. Well, what's amazing, guys, here's irrefutable proof for a uh, post-tribulation rapture is uh, we oftentimes talk about testable predictions here. Isn't that right, Matt? We love the science. So uh, Revelation 6. OK, everything before it, we see we see the seals, the, the tribulation period where the Antichrist is conquering. And we should make a prediction because in Revelation 6, what do we see? The sun and moon being darkened. Isn't that right, Matt? So we should predict, okay, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13 talks about after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be uh, darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and then shall we see the, the, the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven to gather together his elect. And I'm just going to the top of my head there, so I might not have uh, quoted it perfectly. And so we should predict, okay, Revelation 6, the sun and moon are being darkened. We should predict right after this in Revelation 7, there, there should be some kind of rapture event. And I challenge anybody in the chat, go to your Bible, open up Revelation 7. And this is exactly where we read Revelation 7, a great multitude that no man can what? No man could number. From all tongues and all nations. Now, the Bible has numbered some big numbers. Isn't that right, Matt? But this is a number that no man can number, which obviously must be referring to the, the rapture event, the catching up of all believers throughout all time. Okay, this could be a number that no man could number. And it's funny because the exact question is asked, you know, from where did, did these people come from that, that are just standing there suddenly? They just appeared suddenly. Uh, great multitude. And uh, the question is, is answered. These are them which came out of great tribulation. I mean, it, can it be any more clear? Sun and moon are darkened. Revelation 6 correlates perfectly with Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. Revelation 7, fulfilled prediction. Fulfilled prediction. Great multitude appear in heaven. Where'd they come from? Great tribulation. There we go. End of the story. So, you know, the, the point is we just we want people to be prepared uh, you know, we're, we're heading, I'm sure, uh, towards some tough times. And so uh, Stephen nailed it. Yeah, wrath is um, uh, for, well, I'm, I'm not sure if I'd agree with, with the, the Jews part, but uh, wrath is for the unbelievers. The day of his wrath is come. The day of his wrath is come. We see that after the tribulation, okay? And that wrath is for the unbelievers, the unsaved who are left behind. OK, whether Jew, Gentile, any, anybody who's unsaved is is going to be under under God's wrath. So, um, yeah, that that was kind of fun. But I just kind of wanted to go on a rant there since Matt, you asked a great question to Kent during the uh, during the the show uh, about the, the great falling away. So over to you, brother, uh, unless you want to add anything. And then I know you're going to chat about uh, uh, radiometric dating. Yeah, I'm glad I threw that question at him now. Um, and Kent made a, a point a while back. He said one time, he goes, I could be wrong about the rapture. He goes, but here's the thing. If you're not ready, what then? What if the rapture is, is after? And then these three and a half years come and they're horrible times and tribulations and you're not ready because you were expecting to be raptured away first. He goes, all the better if it comes first, but what if it doesn't? So it's just like living in today's world, right? We don't know. There's a depression right around the corner. Food prices might skyrocket. Economies may crash and things can get really bad. So what do we do? We we get ready for it. 
You know, we anticipate the problems. We buy things first. We stock up. That's the same thing with the rapture. We anticipate, okay, things might be bad. We have to go through it. So be it. Let's be ready. <laughs> That's all. Amen, brother. Amen. So did you want to address the uh, radio metric dating uh, question? I wonder if I can find it on screen. Sure. Um, yeah, I can scroll up a little. I'll look as well. But yeah, radio metric dating, um, as far as accuracy goes, I have no problem with its accuracy. And it's like saying, um, I found a watch on the ground and it tells absolutely perfect time. Is the watch wrong? No. It works absolutely fine, but picking up that watch doesn't tell you when it was made. It does, you can't reverse the time and know exactly when that watch was made. So the same thing applies to the radiometric uh, radioactive elements and their decay. We have assumed from the beginning of radioactive decay that it all started out from the beginning during the Big Bang with uranium decaying into all of the different minerals from the radioactive process, right? From uranium, thorium all the way back down to potassium, and then we finally get to iron. Well, what happens is we now have evidence from that Proton 21 laboratories in Ukraine when they were trying to make these radioactive elements for energy sources, uh, that what happens is when they form them from super heavy elements, they, they rapidly decay before they stabilize into the exact same proportions that we have on Earth today. And even when they're tested, they test like they are today, millions or billions of years old, depending on the element tested, of course, uranium being the oldest, that they were billions of years old, even though they were made days prior. So we can't use it as an estimate for how old something is, but we can definitely use radioactive decay for using it as a good clock after they've cooled down and they've met and they've fallen into their half-life. Once that half-life decay rate kicks in, it's very accurate. So it's good to use for a clock, but we can't use it to go back and assume that, you know, uh, we get, just remove the assumptions. Now that we know that those assumptions are invalid anyway, there's no reason that we have to assume that the the time that they give us going back to their origin is true because when they form, they don't, they, they date old instantly. So there's, that's why um, radioactive decay is good but it's not. We've we've had this assumption from the very start that, oh, wow, um, Earth must have been formed uh, through this radioactive process. And then we looked at Earth and it had way too much iron for the process of uranium to get to iron. So they said, okay, something else must have occurred. And then they said, well, maybe it was bombarded by meteors. And that's why there's so much iron here. And that's why there's so much iron on Earth, because maybe the decay didn't have to happen all at once. And then we looked in the geologic record and didn't find many meteor impacts. So they said, okay, well, there's something else going on. And maybe the core isn't iron. Maybe we've assumed wrong. But it really just doesn't matter at this point, because we've observed it. Unfortunately, the Proton 21 laboratory was in Ukraine, and Ukraine is not doing good. So... There goes any scientific uh, further research from Ukraine for quite some time, I would imagine. Uh, yeah. And that was it on, on that one. That's good, brother. That's good. It's, it's one of those shooting themselves in the foot arguments. I mean, Matt, over the last few years, how many times have we addressed their, their very best rebuttals to the fact that we find C-14, which should have completely decayed away in max a million years? You know, we'll we'll give them a million years. It should it, actually a lot uh, shorter than that. But let's say, for sake of argument, a, a million years, and yet we find um, significant levels of of C fourteen in every single layer, for the most part of of the so called geological column. <laughs> and you know, in where diamonds, it should not exist. In, yeah, and in diamonds, zikron crystal. We find it in things that should not be there. <laughs> you can They can claim contamination because we both know they've done that multiple times. We have videos on that. But to say that it somehow got into encapsulated, impossible to penetrate Zykon crystal that dates billions of years old. Come on. There's no way. <laughs> well, Matt, th their main argument, and uh, Dr. Hugh Ross used this one against um, Dr. Jason Lyle, <clears throat> that... Um, Nuclear material, other sources of nuclear material down where the where diamonds are, because d diamonds form deep within the earth, right? So they should be the most resistant to contamination. And C-14 essentially forms due to cosmic ray bombardment in, in the atmosphere. So if you have diamonds that, that are deep within the earth, they're shielded from... Um, 
C14 and in the atmosphere, uh, basically. And um, so the uh, more militant or adamant old earthers, deep time proponents, they'll say that, that there should be other sources of uh, nuclear material uh, down where, where the diamonds are that can recharge the C14, right? And uh, what's funny is numerous PhD scientists have looked into this, Matt. And they estimated that you would need more than 13,000 times. Okay, let me make that clear to the audience. 13,000 times more nuclear material in the nearby rocks in order uh, to adequately recharge the, the, the C-14. And so um, what this boils down to is, is a rescue device. OK, because you would need far too much material to recharge. And I'm talking about unrealistic amounts deep down in the earth where cosmic rays cannot reach um, the, these diamonds and, and other samples as well. So the point is just this one line of argument, guys, refutes deep time, refutes the deep time assumptions. They don't have a good response. And their responses, that being their best one, has been analyzed. And it's been systematically demolished. That's it. They got nowhere to go. You know, if, if there's another uh, contamination has been dealt with. Okay. So that's not looking good for, um, d for deep time. Helium in, in zircon crystals. I mean, helium is an incredibly slippery molecule. What's it still doing in, in, in these uh, zircon crystals? Matt, over to you, brother. <laughs> no, you nailed it. I just saw a comment pop up that said, where can I buy your book? Um, I didn't put the link yet in the comment section, but I put it in private chat for you to link so everyone can see it. Yeah, and let me uh, say, let yeah. me say this. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna share a screen. So we have put in our um, our final updates. Okay. So here here's the book in Dodge's Retrovirus Handbook. I've got it in front of me. Um, the final updated version, the good to go uh, version, I am uh, in Matt, I think you can see in, in the KDP. It looks like the updates um, should be done and the book should be ready for sale in, I would say in the next several hours. So guys, please check into this video later too. And I'll, I'll put it in the description box, the link to it on Amazon for people to buy. And I'll also make a community post. We're also working on, on a trailer. So I want to give the links when I know all updates are, are complete, guys, because this is really a full dismantling of endogenous retroviruses. But not only that, also common descent in general. Okay, and it's confirmation of the biblical creation model of ancestry. Here's the, the colored version that we actually um, just put in to be published. And it looks like that's probably going to be available too, eh, Matt, around the, the same time, which is pretty cool. Um, Matt, I, I'd like to, uh, especially because we got a, a nice audience here, and I would recommend there, there, there was a video I did recently uh, dealing with this objection in great detail. But because we have a nice audience here right now, and it is a commonly repeated argument, Matt, what are your thoughts on this whole uh, criticism or objection to young earth creation and the biblical model of ancestry that says uh, crossover rates or recombination rates uh, today are, are far too slow for young earth creationists to account for? Because we know there is higher levels of genetic diversity in Africans versus non-Africans. And so Africans, for one, they'll say are older than non-Africans and humans in general, both Africans and non-Africans go well, well back um, further than 6,000 years. And one of their arguments is, is recombination rates. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, brother? Well, we're looking at recombination rates in people today. Uh, for one. And the reason that that can be a general mistake is because when we're looking at people today, we, there's a couple things that we see. Different people have different rates of recombination. So if recombination is what's causing genetic diversity, well, what would we expect in our model? Well, if all, different people groups are all the same age, right? We're all different people, but Africans were not first. Why do Africans appear older? Well, they appear older because they have more PRDM9, which means more sites for hotspots and recombination to occur. So therefore they have more mutations, making them look genetically older, but they're not. Another thing to take into account is that human beings in our model, from what we've seen, live longer. The longer you live, the more recombination events you're going to have. 
Also going into the past, we see that people also had larger genomes. When you have more genomes, you have more areas for hot spots and recombination to occur, therefore making recombination events even faster. So yes, we can account for it, just like we can account for it in mutation rates that we observe as well, but it's much easier to answer it when we take these other factors in. Great points. And what's amazing is this is all once again supported by the primary source data. You know, I've got a whole section on this as well in the uh, endogenous retrovirus handbook. But again, I highly recommend everybody in the chat pick up a copy. OK, I am going to have the links ready uh, tonight sometime. The second all the updates are in. And um, I want everybody to have, of course, the most completed version. But we uh, we refute these uh, talking points, the best so-called arguments the evolutionists have directly from the uh, primary source data. As Matt was pointing out, I mean, this PRDM9 DNA element, okay, it is a driver of, of the genetic map. And Matt, what does this say? Most, if not what, all meiotic recombination rates or events are controlled by PRDM9. And I've got a number of papers that show how Africans have more of these sites. They have more... Um, recombination hotspots. Okay. These PRDM9 DNA elements, they, they look for, uh, you know, certain letters, these hotspots, you know, they, they latch onto it and then they recombine. Okay. And Africans have more of these, which means they they have more pieces of DNA and there is just technical paper after technical paper after technical paper. Isn't that right, Matt? That shows how recombination rates, um, vary even even within the genome and, and in different populations. Now, Matt, if, if mutations over time are destroying genetic functionality, are degenerating the genome and its many uh, various classes of functional and beneficial DNA elements, including the PRDM9 DNA element, what happens over time is these PRDM9 sites are eroded and destroyed. More mutations, more harmful, more sickness, more disease. What do we see in the world today? Exactly that. Right. So when and, people go, oh, God. Well, I was just going to say, and if they're eroding, as you're pointing out, uh, if they're eroding uh, the genome leading to more disease and, and degeneration overall, but they're also eroding these DNA elements, the PRDM9 sites. Right. That means less recombination over time, which means logically in the past, what do we have? More, more recombination, recombination. So more obvious. diversity okay africans have more pieces of dna not because of age but because of what matt recombination recombination paper and, look, paper. and look at this they even admit this in their own work it is thought that we they we split from a common ancestor five six million years ago more than enough time for substantial genetic differences to develop but yet in their own model we don't have those we should but they're not there. Notice that they even admit it. They go, ah, there should be more differences, but there's not. So something must have happened. <laughs> Real scientific. Huh? Yeah. Something must have happened. <laughs> something no predictions. Have, no nothing. Right. Yeah. Something must have happened. Um, Iron Mag, good to see you, brother. And yes, uh, tonight. Uh, for sure, it's going to be available. And I'm going to be doing a series of interviews on ERV, some presentations. We're going to have some fun with this and get it into the hands of as many people as possible. Matt, what are your thoughts on this argument? Because we oftentimes discuss the evidence for uh, mitochondrial Eve, Y chromosome Noah, right? The fact that every single Y chromosome on the planet is nearly identical, extremely low genetic variation. Same with the mitochondrial DNA, right? Low variation in both of these uniparentally inherited DNA compartments. Um, we also know that the observed rate, the pedigree rate, <clears throat> okay, is fast, a lot faster than the evolutionary community has ever predicted. So wait a minute. We got only a few DNA differences, okay, separating any two people in both of these DNA compartments. But yet we also have a fast mutation rate. Well, that means these DNA compartments must be young. But the evolutionists, right? They have a problem explaining why there is such low a variation in the mitochondrial DNA, which on a phylogenetic tree, okay, you can take mitochondrial DNA worldwide, you can take uh, Y chromosomal variation worldwide, and you can build these family trees that point us right back to one woman 
of whom all we've we've descended from, one man of whom we've all descended from, Y chromosome Noah. Okay. But Matt, they'll say, well, the reason why is because, you know, for one, you guys are looking at the pedigree rate, the empirical rate. And not the phylogenetic rate, the long-term <laughs> substitution, right? So you're laughing already because <laughs> you've heard this. Uh, I mean, we've got a whole entire book uh, debunking this. So they'll say the dodgeball dance of the world. They'll say, uh, you know, over time you've got, uh, you know, you got draft, you've got selection. So a lot of these variants are, are removed over time or they're just completely lost. Uh, bottlenecks to consider. So that is essentially their explanation for why there's low variation and the fast mutation rate. Um, what would be your response, brother? Okay. As a young Earth creationist, we are the same as every other scientific group of people out there. All we have to do is be able to explain the diversity of life that we see around us. So when we look inside of humans and we say, what's the mutation rate that's happening inside of our bodies? How fast are these mutations ticking? And how fast does a new mutation arise and then go through the entire population before it reaches something called fixation, where now that mutation is in every single human being? So imagine something like blue eyes being a new mutation. Well, how long would that mutation take in the population in the world today before everybody has blue eyes? Well, with seven or eight billion people, it would take a really, really long time. But if we go back in time and we start from creation, it would have only been two people. Going back to the flood, we only have eight people. So when we have a smaller population of people, fixation happens very quickly. Well, what did groups of people right after the flood do? Well, we're, we were told in both scenarios, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Humans didn't really do that very much. We didn't really listen too good. We listened to the multiply part, but not really fill the earth. We stayed in one area. And when that happened, these fast mutation rates in our body rapidly reached fixation. But even then, there's only about 24 fixed substitutions in all of humans worldwide. That's not very many. We can account for this based on how fast the mutation rate is. And we can look at studies like this, which give us the answer that we're looking for, which means, can we explain the genetic diversity in humans today in a young earth creation timescale? And the answer is yes. All of these studies using observable pedigree studies, meaning we've taken either a grandparent and a father or a father and a son, and we've tracked that back multiple generations. Some of these studies go back 11 generations. Some just take multiple people from around the world and go from their parent to the grandparent. And then we test and we add up all the new mutations and we say, how many mutations and substitution rates are there in these things? Can we explain the genetic diversity? And we can, because the mutation rate is so fast, we can explain the vast amounts of genetic differences in all humans, just a few thousand years. But evolution, they need these rates to be exponentially slower because remember they made up and invented it a genetic bottleneck 200,000 years ago that there's no evidence for in their own geologic column. So they need to invent a mutation rate that goes to that invented bottleneck and they still can't do it. There's not a single pedigree mutation rate that's slow enough for them to even go back even remotely close to 200,000 years. So what does that tell you? Who's using the rescue device? Who's using the actual empirical evidence? There's a reason that they invoke selection. There's a reason that they invoke drift because they have to. They don't have any evidence for it. That's why they re that's why they ignore that CO1 gene that's that where selection doesn't take place. Well, guess what? You know, we've made predictions on the CO1 gene. <laughs> they ignore it because selection doesn't matter there, right? They want to just focus on the entire mitochondria or the control region or the hypervariable regions where selection might play a little significant factor if there's a big mutation there. But we're only talking one mutation out of 200 because remember, it's selection's only going to see the worst mutations, not these trivial little ones that we can get from smoking cigarettes and, you know, little ones that are a little somatic mutations here and there. Those don't get passed on through the germline. Those are somatic mutations. So I 
hope that made a little sense. I went on a little tirade there. <laughs> no, man, you take as listen, you take as long as you want. This is important. These are the lines of evidence that we focus on that absolutely crush, crush common descent and deep time evolution and universal common ancestry. Okay. But at the same time, these lines of evidence that we focus on confirm, confirm biblical creation. And again, anyone just joining us tonight, stay tuned. The endogenous retrovirus handbook will be available. And not only does it dismantle ERVs, and I'm sure anybody who follows this channel knows uh, the EVR, that's the ERV, that's the evolutionist top argument, okay? Their favorite argument. But it turns out after examining the data, after examining the primary source data, okay, the existence of ERV and ERV-like sequences is amazing confirmation of the design diversity hypothesis. So Matt, based on what you were saying, brother, great points. And I'm going to go back to... Um, what you're, you were saying at the beginning of your explanation, when we have a small population of people, let's say after the flood, you got eight people, Noah, his wife, Shem, Ham, Japheth, their wives. And we all essentially descend from those founding couples, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives, right? And um, you have a fast mutation rate on a small population. When it comes to fixation, fixation uh, to anybody in the audience, that just means to get stuck in place, okay? Fixation rates would be higher, right, Matt? Yep. So we have a small population, faster fixation rates. So what does that mean about the low variation in, let's say, the mitochondrial DNA compartment? That pretty well on its own refutes their, their rescue devices that they're looking to because it's our model that has an out of Babel dispersal where we have the majority of, of people at that time congregating in, in one area. How many people do you think were around the, at the Tower of Babel? Um, you know, we can we can go upwards of, let's say, 20,000. Why not? Right. OK, so let's say 20,000 and then at the flood eight. So we have a fast mutation rate. We have patriarchal drive. Um, matriarchal drive may apply. I think more study has to be done in, into that. Um, and so rapid and exponential population growth. So just in a few generations, you have bam, 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 fixation of new mutations, right? Yep. And yet today, okay. as we can see here, guys, this is a mitochondrial uh, phylogeny, okay? This is just, uh, just to break it down so the layperson can understand. This is a, a reflection a manifestation of worldwide mitochondrial DNA diversity. So the mitochondrial DNA we inherit from our mothers. The Y chromosome, the uh, Y chromosomal DNA we inherit from our fathers. OK, so I got my Y chromosome from my dad. I got my mitochondrial DNA from my mom. That's why we call these DNA compartments, right, Matt? The uniparentally inherited DNA compartments. They're not the biparentally DNA inherited compartments. They're the uniparentally inherited DNA compartments, which means they're, they're less messy and they're perfect when it comes to answering this question of ancestry. OK, pretty well, no recombinations occurring. We have the scrambling of pre-existing DNA differences every single generation. OK, so what you can see here on this tree is random mutations in people groups over, over time. But we only have a few DNA differences. I think the mitochondrial Eve consensus sequence, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong. On average, you have about 20 to 25 DNA differences separating any two people. And the max, which would be your, your larger lines on the phylogenetic tree, your, your African lines, you'd have between 100 and maybe 140 max. Okay, so very low variation and a fast mutation rate. And according to our model, Matt, as you're pointed out, rapid fixation events after the flood and probably right around... Um, the, the Tower of Babel event before people spread out in all parts of the globe, which gets into a whole nother set of arguments pertaining to allele frequencies and geographically specific Y chromosome uh, differences. And it explains the Neanderthal as well, because they stayed in small populations, which means more fixations, more mutations, and therefore they look older. Amen. Amen. So their argument that... We're only focusing on the pedigree rate. We're ignoring the substitution rate, the long-term mutation rate. Apparently, we're ignoring selection. We're ignoring bottlenecks. We're, we're ignoring um, the amount of, of differences that are lost over time. That, uh, that doesn't work, does it, Matt? 
No, no, because I made this little chart for people that you can see right here. And uh, like, how long would it take to get to the top of a pyramid? You know, if it's just made by a few people, well, not very long because it's a small pyramid. That would be you're an example of a fixation. If there's just a small population to get to the top of a pyramid when you're walking doesn't take very long. Well, that's how long it would take for a mutation to re get inside of all of these people right here. But if there's a lot of people, that's a much larger pyramid and a much harder time for a mutation to reach fixation. But our model can explain these few fixed substitutions that are in the human population because if deep time was true, human populations all throughout time were in very small populations through multiple bottlenecks that that means there should be a lot more fixed substitutions than we actually see we can account for this because it makes sense in our model evolution has no answer for why in the world there's so few because of deep time hey amen again well said exactly what we would expect exactly what we would expect based on the biblical um model of ancestry Right. I mean, with, with these trees, again, for the audience sake, you know, this this is important. And, and these are the types of arguments that we focus on. For example, um, in the Independent Origins Handbook, you'll find this. And um, on our website, you'll find uh, two specific books, Special Creation and Refuting the Critics, where we address the critics' best arguments. OK, so you'll notice explosive growth from a center point. Right. And. Um, this is exactly what we'd expect. We were talking about from the biblical point of view, you have rapid growth from a starting point, right? From Eve, from Noah, essentially, low variation. And the evolutionists, they want to hold to what's called the evolutionary molecular clock, right, Matt? And they want to, um, for the most part, assume the chimpanzee human split, assume evolution happened, right? Assume deep time, assume the geological column. That's why they're really good at what's called circular reasoning, circular reasoning. And so they want to count up the differences between humans and chimpanzees and calculate backwards. And that's where they come up with a, a very slow molecular clock. But Matt, as you've pointed out, the molecular clock is fast, is fast. And the fixation rate at part, portions of human history, we're fast too during the, 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 the bottlenecks, especially the, the flood bottleneck to be specific. But you can look to uh, a specific haplogroups here, the HVR, most common in, in Europe. Notice the, the differing size, size lines, right, Matt? This means uh, some people are picking up more mutations than their cousins in the same amount of time. <laughs> That breaks the assumptions behind the evolutionary molecular clock. That means, right, Matt, you can't look then to differences between humans and chimpanzees and make the assumptions that they want to make. They can't do that. They can't do that. Okay. Universally, the clock is fast. We actually can see different rates um, in, in the same amount of time. So, um, yeah, go ahead, brother. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, and we know that the clock is different just looking at human beings, let alone in different animal species. You know, I like to point out um, and show this little chart, like which one's older? Um, well, evolution would say that the or orangutan and then the, or the pongo and then the gorilla and then the chimp and then humans was last. And they base that on mutations. There's more mutations here and there's less mutations, less mutations and then the least mutations. But wait a minute. They invoked a bottleneck, right? Right here. Everything came through a bottleneck. Whether or not it's the global bottle bottleneck that we say it was from the flood, they say it was probably some type of volcano. So it really doesn't matter. So let's say that this is a volcano 200,000 years ago. Well, guess what? A bottleneck resets genetic diversity. So what are these doing with more genetic differences than all the others? Well, guess what? That's what sets those genetic boundaries up that we talk about. These have more mutations in them, not because we're related, but because these have a faster generation time, a much faster generation time. So when you look at a phylogenetic chart that shows these older than these, older than these, and older than these, it's because of the assumption that these are older. But now we know that they can't be older because of a genetic bottleneck. And the mutations that we're seeing in them are based on a generation time. Let's say that all, all of us right here, every single one that we're just related, and um, there's three mutations that happen in every single generation. Well, if 
pongos have a generation time at the age of four and five and a human has one at 30 guess what it's going to look like <laughs> that pongo is going to look much older genetically and evolutionarily than a human because they've had four times more generations in the in the exact same time period in the span so that's what we're seeing when we look at the phylogenetic charts is we're seeing their assumption of neutral theory is eradicated based on what we now know with uh, actual bottlenecks and resetting of the DNA. So everything came out of a bottleneck. Everything's the same age. They have more genetic differences, not because they're older, but because they've had more generations, even if the mutation rate was exactly the same. So end of story. Well, what about the, what about the dodgeball Dan's of the world that say, listen, this isn't evidence for creation because you've got uh, species originating, 90% of species originating in the genetic boundary study. So uh, the dodgeball Dan's of the world will say what, Matt? They'll say that means you had previous archetypes that these species would have originated from. So by definition, that can't be the creation uh, event. Is that right, Matt? <laughs> Correct. It literally proves the flood. It means that 90% right. of life today came out of 10%. That's in that doorway right there. Well, what could that have been? What's 10% back going back in time? all the animals that were on the ark. So that's true. They came off the boat and that's what we have today after thousands of years. <laughs> it's, it was never a creation event. Isn't this hilarious, Matt, that over the years now we've published what? Our li library has at least over a dozen books and we've done a ton of shows on, on genetic boundaries and answering a uh, Gutsy Gibbons question. OK, we've had uh, we, we've we've done a ton on this. We've had videos and, and um, articles and uh, sections within our books refuting the best arguments they can offer. And the best arguments they offer, Matt, is a straw man fallacy. Yeah, is a straw man fallacy. They don't even they don't even get the basics right. No. We're not talking about the creation event here. We're talking about the flood bottleneck. So start <laughs> again. Try again. Okay, and hopefully I mean, you can do better next time. They can they can go to answers in Genesis and and read their articles on that on that uh, model or on that study. They can go to CMI and read it. They can go to Dr. Jensen and read what he wrote on it. They all say the same thing. It's the flood. Not any of them say it was creation. Right. It's um. Here, let me let, let me. So Jerome M. A uh, couple questions. So he asked, is there a, um, here, let me share my screen as well, brother. So is there a, a colored edition battle of the screen shares? Hey, Matt. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I love Hey, Listen, man, I'm a visual learner and you know, there's been studies done that you will comprehend. People will comprehend more when, when there's a visual, when you have a power, if they're seeing what, what we're saying, if they're seeing what they're hearing, they could, they comprehend and retain more. And that's why we love slides. That's why we have thousands of them, right, Matt? We love visuals. Visual so um, the answer is yes, Jerome, brother. We've got, I've got the black and white version in front of me here, endogenous retrovirus handbook. Okay, but there is a uh, full color edition as well that should be published tonight. So to answer your second question, uh, I, I have been periodically checking. It says updates are in review, uh, which means we're just a few hours away uh from right matt or if updates are in review does that mean that if, if people order it tonight they'll, they'll get like the the actual finished copy or they'll get it depends on where they are um there's some places that print them out like immediately when they get them and it might be the earlier copy because our attempt to publish the first one uh was met with resistance by amazon and now they've said okay we'll do it but then we had to update it so now we'll have that updated version which will probably be uh based on how fast they're doing everything you know in about 12 hours okay for the color one because right. so so for both i would say then um to everybody in the chat yeah wait till my notification tonight sometime either in community posts i'll also put the links here in the description box of this video uh when it's good to go so people can order again it's 170 pages it's the most uh comprehensive response to ervs that that you're going to be able to find matt i wanted to kind of showcase this real quick yes um from the video that you uploaded on um let me see here so your video, Biblical Genetic Diversity Explained by Recombination, because uh, there's even um, 
a specific young earth creationist that was conceding this point to the most militant of, of critics saying bravo you know crossover rates and young earth creation and the fact that young earth young earth creationists cannot account for uh the amount of uh recombination that has apparently occurred in humans um when no we we have an answer we've had an answer and the answer comes directly from the primary source data we we, we touched on this earlier uh, so for sake of time, we won't do it again. But I do recommend people check out these videos. So uh, One Punch Man, who's a, who's a great brother, he was asking, do Africans have a faster recombination rate? And uh, just for the audience sake, there are a ton of um, great sources here that can kind of get you started. And then the book's going to have more. So Matt, you pointed out PRDM9 variants, uh, common in Africans, but rare in, in um, Europeans. And over here, I posted empirical studies have shown that African Americans have higher recombination estimates uh, compared to or rates compared to European. Because remember, the Africans have more of these sites, more fully working PRDM9 DNA elements. And lo and behold, what do they have? Higher levels of genetic diversity. They have more pieces of DNA. That's not because of age. It's because of a process. We talk about this all the time. Not time, a process. Not time, a process. This applies to geology. This applies to astronomy. This also applies to genetics. Okay, gene conversion also plays a role in what's called linkage disequilibrium. Uh, gene conversion may play a significant role in the DK kinetics of LD which is linkage dis disequilibrium in human populations. Notice this, crossover events tend to uh, reduce population level association known as linkage disequilibrium. Um, but right here, among alleles on either side of the crossover. And so the expected amount of LD between sites depends on what? The recombination rate. So if you have faster recombination rates, more effective recombination rates in some people, then that people group will harbor more genetic diversity. It has nothing to do with time. Notice this. We identified several genes in African Americans and five in European Americans that show substantive evidence for a hot spot in one population, but not the other, which raises the question of whether populations differ in their recombination landscape. Matt, what did we touch on earlier? That paper that says PRDM9 is a driver of genetic what? Landscape. Okay. These critics need to accept the answer for what it is. Okay, but a lot of them aren't actually looking for answers. So it's in one ear and out the other. Notice this, right, Matt, how many times have these critics said, well, you know, the PRDM9 doesn't mean that, that we're looking at faster recombination rates, right? Matt, what does this say? Because the recombination process varies among individuals and through evolutionary time, there's that evolution assumptions, differences in hotspot characters. So listen, there's a lot of factors to consider that the evolutionary community doesn't want to consider that the militant critics of evolution do not want to consider. So I just wanted to point that out, Matt. Go ahead, brother. Nice, nice. No, I saw a comment that was pretty funny. BBC released a uh, latest proof of a global extinction. They said it was a flood. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, there a lot of people are anti-catastrophism because of Charles Lyell. So we don't investigate those types of things. Um, you know, for good reason, they kind of hard to investigate something that will nullify and falsify your theory, but uh, <laughs> kind of makes sense why they would uh, ignore it. But I'm interested to see how long ago they said it was and why. I right. mean, we know why, but we know why. But, but what's their because as we point out, like the genetics boundary study, uh, Right, Matt, that uh, demonstrate yeah. all species have arisen at the exact same time. You know, mm -hmm. a, a bottleneck, but of course not the biblical bottleneck, not not the flood. But and then and then the date they give two hundred thousand years is that based on observed mutation rates, the empirical mm -hmm. method, or is that yeah. based on evolutionary and deep time assumptions? It was on assumption. First of all, the study wasn't even for trying to determine a time. It's that's not what the study was even about. So that that wasn't the focus. They but they had to give a time, right? And so what are they going to use? Well, the accepted time is two hundred thousand years. So just throw it in. No one's going to question it. Nobody knows what's going on. So, but then again, look at all these pedigree rate studies. How come all the different studies keep saying? Uh, humans most recent common ancestor of all present day humans lived just a few thousand years ago no matter what model you look at <laughs> it's why 
why does it keep happening? Why is this showing young Earth creation timelines? Why why are we able to explain the diversity using the observable rates? And they have to invoke that our observed rates are wrong and their assumption rates are correct. And we must be wrong because young Earth creation can't be true. Who's in desperation mode? Who's in desperation mode? It should be obvious. Well, they're on the defense. And Matt, can you cover this slide? This is a fantastic slide that, that you Sorry, put I together, well. just showing how powerful the biblical creation model is, guys. In the chat, I want to point out, it's a great time to be a young earth creationist. And, uh, you know, we at Standing for Truth Ministries, we, we do bring the heat, okay? Uh, we bring the heat to uh, the, the, the evolutionist side, the militant evolutionists, they're on the defense. They're challenged to make better testable predictions and put forth a more superior model. We, we've addressed their, their so-called best challenges. We've answered their, their uh, you know, uh, toughest questions. And um, we've overturned their, their model and uh, we've provided a more superior one. And it's, it's about time they step up and it's it's precisely why it's a great time to be a young earth creationist. So Matt, yeah, go ahead, man. This is a fantastic visual. I have to thank Brendan for making these visuals for us. But yeah, um, I was like, you know what? I'm going to make a video putting evolution versus creation on a stand side by side. Who's better at making predictions? Is it evolution or is it creation? Because that's what makes a, a, a hypothesis an actual theory. Don't don't tell me you've got a piece of evidence like a phone and then build the story around why the phone is there and then say that your story is better than mine when you can't prove yours. You envision why this happened, but I show you the observable proof of how this was made and you deny it. OK, that's what we're saying. That's what we're seeing. So when we come along and we go, let's go through this real quick and say, what about genetic similarity? Well, they predict no genetic similarity. Why? Because we know that they did. <laughs> we literally know the names of the people who made these predictions based on genetic similarity. And I'm sorry to tell you, evolutionists, it was not good for you guys because you predicted no genetic similarity. And you would have been right if evolution was true. I'll tell you that it's true. Because genetic differences build up because of mutations. And you can't have hundreds of millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years even and still expect there to be genetic similarity because it would have evolved away. But yet, what do we see? Exactly what we would expect if the timeline is young with all animals, with all, all things. We have fast mutation rates. You guys said it's slow. We have few mutations in the mitochondria, yet mutation saturation should be something you guys would find we find rapid diversification via what's known as punctuated equilibrium and you guys need slow deep time gradualism which we don't see even see even in the fossil record <laughs> even the fossil record now agrees with punctuated equilibrium kind of ironic we say that there was a global flood bottleneck where everything was reduced either to two or seven which would cause a founder effect evolution said no the evolutionary genomic increase can't come from two inbreeding animals. They would die. Inbreeding would kill them. That's exactly the opposite of what we found, what we predicted. No big deal, right? Genetic boundaries. They said there's no limits on genetic boundaries. Everything's related. There's taxonomically restrictive orphan genes and all these other DNA elements like endogenous retroviruses, right? Well, guess what? There's no such thing as a, as a taxonomic boundary or any of these problems in the evolutionary model. And they use taxonomy as the main piece of evidence, or at least the top three, for the reason evolution is true. And taxonomy has a taxonomic boundary paradox, so it actually refutes them. <laughs> it's just absolutely ironic that they use these things, number one, genetic similarity, and number two, taxon taxonomy, and these are on our side. So sorry, guys. Then they predicted junk DNA. Remember, 99.9% .9 worthless, has no function. Encode comes out. Uh-oh. Young Earth creation proven again. All one race. Evolution. Even Darwin said, now there's different races. Of course there is. There has to be. People evolved in different areas from different things. Neanderthal made Europeans. Africans evolved out of, uh, you know, some other species. 
Then we have the chromosome differences. They never expected there was a chromosome difference between humans and chimpanzees. They found it after and said, "Uh oh, well, there must have been a chromosome fusion. So what they do, they made some random idea like, well, we'll make a prediction that there was a fusion. And then they invented what they found was a chromosome fusion event. But yet it would have to be completely different than every other chromosome fusion event in the, on Earth because every other chromosome fusion event contains satellite DNA, which is are sequences of DNA strands that are very unique, like like telomeres, but they stand out. They're called satellite DNA. And those are at everywhere there's a chromosome fusion in nature, except for it's not in humans. Uh-oh, I guess magic had let that one happen, huh? Then we expect to find, sure, there's going to be some living fossils because not everything is going to die in the global flood. Something in, in the aquatic species are going to live through it. Why not? Of course, right? God who hasn't told uh, tell Noah to take fish on the ark. So, of course, if there's going to be things in the ocean still alive, it's because it survived the flood. We find living fossils. They never predicted that. They have living fossils that supposedly are 400 million years old. Think about that. How many bottlenecks in the evolutionary model happened over 400,000 years? You're going to tell me that it survived every one of those? They, they can't even get a, a bee to survive a few degrees temperature without them going extinct, right? We're going to lose the bees. The temperature went up two degrees. Oh, yet you want me to believe that they survived multiple bottlenecks? Come on. And then uh, differently designed anatomical functions as where they said, oh, there's going to be vestigial worthless leftover remnants of organs, right? So take the appendix, for example. They said, ah, it lost its primary function. Well, what is its primary function? Well, in chimpanzees, it's to break down plant cellulose when they eat something, right? It's so they can eat leaves. Go outside and try to eat a leaf. It's not going to work. That's why we cook those types of foods, right? So what does it do in humans? It Well, What's the secondary function in a chimpanzee? Is it is it a backup immune system like it is in humans? No, it's not. So what's it doing as something as important as producing killer B cells inside the cell like the thyroid produces killer T cells on the outside of a cell? This isn't some backup secondary function that it just gradually evolved over time. This is a very important function. That's why when you remove it, that's why the first defenders of the body are the white blood cells. And then once the virus or pathogen or bacteria gets near a cell, the defender cells, which are the killer T cells, try to attack it. And if it gets past them, it's got your backup killer B cells inside the cells that can finally attack as a third layer of defense. So you just remove your appendix. You just lost your third defender of your own body. That's not some random chance thing that just evolved slowly over time. And that's not a secondary function of what that anatomical uh, organ does in a chimpanzee or any other primate. These are individual created aspects that are very functionally different. So they can say it's, oh, it's just some vestigial leftover secondary function that's going on in a human being. Well, okay, you can say that all you want, but is the secondary function in a chimpanzee what it does in a human? No. Okay. End of story. Falsified. And then we see rapid speciation. If we see rapid speciation today in a world that's completely full and saturated, then how much faster was speciation in a world where there weren't anything getting off of an arc? Think about it. You have multiple different niches of environments completely empty and void of all creatures. So you have species diversifying and moving out and filling up all these gaps of cold areas, warm areas, deserts, forests, uh, tropical rainforest, and uh, all these different things and rapid speciation events going on, right? You get rapid punctuated equilibrium where there's, I mean, we can go to the Galapagos goes island and we can see that birds are speciating at a rate of every one every three generations well that's on an island where they're already existing imagine when they first got there how fast it could have been to fill up all these niches so we can easily explain the diversity of life that we see through rapid speciation very very easily but evolution would say no remember darwin predicted that there wouldn't be a new finch species for another 3,000 years. That was his prediction on how slow speciation should be based on evolution. We find now it's one every three generations or 3.3 years, completely the opposite of evolutionary predictions. So every single one of those would be predictions that were made by us versus them. They got wrong. We got right. End of story, man. And this list is just this because, I mean, it could have been redundant. I could have made this three times bigger, but look how long it took to go through. <laughs> Why, right? Why beat a dead horse to death? Why beat it? I don't get it. Just it's game over. Well, you know, we are beating that uh, dead horse known as evolution. Uh, we are beating it over and over again. You know, I'm starting to feel bad for it. Not really, but uh, <laughs> that uh, right there, brother. That last 15 minutes, uh, as Redefined Living pointed out, Matt Man breaking it down. 
you know, give us a flex. And so what we should do, uh, that right there is, is clip worthy. That is full scale demolition of evolutionary theory. Okay. Someone in the chat said, you're straw manning us. We don't believe we, uh, you know, evolved from bananas. Nobody's saying that we understand that you believe you and a banana plant are related through common ancestry. You and a strawberry are related through common ancestry. That doesn't make it any better. Okay, it's still embarrassing. It's still not science. Okay, it's not supported by the science. It requires imagination. And um, as Kent likes to say and did say in this show earlier, uh, you know, they should start their own private school, SpongeBob University. And, uh, you know, anybody who wants to pay for the science fiction belief that, uh, you know, whales and banana plants are related through common ancestry can attend that school privately. Uh, one thing I want to mention, Matt, and uh, a lot of compliments on that slide, brother. So if you want, uh, anybody wants th this slide, um, shoot us an email or just share screen and, and it can be yours and, uh, you know, uh, crop it out. So the last thing I want to say before we wind down here is we're coming at two and a half hours. Anybody who's just joining us, uh, the first about hour and 15 minutes, we had uh, Ken Hoven here with us and uh destroyed you know the, the the favorite lines of evidence the evolutionists like to offer and then uh we spent another hour and a half or so um just going over some of the amazing evidence for biblical creation uh because matt you ever notice that the evolutionists they'll say well where's all the evidence for biblical creation then well y y here you go okay just roughly an hour or so worth of uh, irrefutable information for biblical creation matt you and I both know we, we could talk about this till till the rapture. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's overwhelming, actually. Here's a sneak peek because I have had uh, comments and emails coming through asking specifically about uh, shared ALU sequences in, in primates. And here's just a sneak peek, which you'll find in the ERV book here. I've got a section, about 10 pages, 10 or 11 pages specifically dealing with this argument. Uh, it's very similar to the ERV argument, but... Um, a, a lot of the critics, they'll say, you know, there, there's one or two functions, maybe, and they'll say that they'll downplay the evidence so they can chalk it up to co-option. Okay. Um, but that's just not the case. I mean, there are role after role after role in these uh, functional units of, of DNA. Okay. So here's just a sneak preview, a few, uh, few technical papers. Uh, remember we're destroying evolution right from the primary source data. Isn't that right, Matt? Jumping genes have essential biological functions. The ALU DNA sequences, which are mobile within our genome. So again, these mobile DNA elements, they help to generate diversity. They generate diversity and that diversity can be passed on. It can be inherited, okay? That's why um, one of the various titles that have been uh, given or applied to these uh, created units of DNA function is called variation inducing genetic elements. Regulate the activity of ribosomes and notice this and contribute to the cells immunity. Why do a lot of these DNA elements resemble, you know, parasitic uh, genetic material or viral genetic material? Why do they appear to be the uh, result of ancient invasions of various kinds? That is because their similarities, the structure of these DNA sequences, okay, they are necessary in order for these created units of DNA function to carry out many of their jobs. Two of their jobs involving immunity, cellular immunity, antiviral protection. These complexes are also used by cells to adapt to conditions of stress, cell stress responses. This is amazing, amazing evidence the evolutionists aren't really aware of. And they play a role in the process of protein synthesis by regulating the number of active ribosomes. Notice this. Um, the uh, these elements, okay, are functional in, in gene expression, in, in the brain. Um, ALU, mobile elements from junk DNA to genomic gems. <laughs> Sometimes you read these articles, eh, Matt? You'll read these headlines, you'll read these technical papers, and it almost sounds like they are being written by intelligent design advocates or biblical creationists. I mean, this is something we say. Alu mobile elements from junk DNA, which the critics say, oh, these are all mostly junk. 
to genomic gems. No, we as a biblical creationist, we expect, we predict genomic gems, genomic treasure. Okay, so for sake of time, I won't go through all of this. Here's another one. Uh, differences in alu methylation. Notice this, Matt. This is fascinating. And the male and female germline suggest that alu DNA may be involved in either the unique chromatin organization of sperm or signaling events in the early embryo. So just like these ERV sequences and ERV elements, alu sequences also function in embryological De uh, development. So I just wanted to point that out, guys. Um, let me just refresh real quick the Amazon page. And uh, we are going to wrap it up here. We've been going for two and a half hours now. This is a ton of fun. We've had a fantastic audience. I want to thank everybody for being here. Tons of great questions, tons of great engagement and, and feedback. So look out, guys. Uh, later tonight, I will make a community post, and I'll put the links in the description box here. The Endogenous Retrovirus Handbook. I will be doing a series of interviews and videos pertaining to this uh, new book, which will be available in color and also black and white, okay? So look out for it, and it's worth it, I promise you. Uh, it's a huge game changer. Once the links become available, click it, get yourself a copy, pass it around. This stuff is, is important. Now, I do want to say that later this week, the Evolution Debate Challenge continues. Uh, the big round two, the big rematch, chapter two, Dr. Dino and uh, James W., they will be uh, they will be debating and uh, round one actually still holds the record between 500 and 600 people live for this epic event. And so uh, I'm sure round two will also be a debate to remember. Uh, Wednesday, we've got uh, Professor David McQueen. I believe this is going to be his sixth, maybe seventh formal debate. So he is our ministry and uh, team geologist. So he's he's a retired geologist. Luca Medugno is uh, he's a chemist. He's he's a, working as a teacher right now. So this is going to be a very technical debate, very sophisticated debate. Does the heat problem preclude the global flood? So this one is Wednesday, and uh, I got to say I'm really really looking forward to this one. Now anybody not subscribed, hit the subscribe button. We've got a diversity of topics. We don't only um, host debates on creation evolution. We host debates on the nature of God. We host debates on soteriology, morality. So we've got a big debate on soteriology. Does the Bible teach salvation by faith alone or salvation by faith plus works? This is uh, June 9th. So June 9th, uh, this is going to be a heroic showdown. Robert Wilkin and uh, Robert Genis, guys. So that is just a snap shot of, of the overall... Um, the. the I'm laughing at crazy. I'd be good to see a sophisticated. Love that word, brother. And I uh, particularly like that word because what I see a lot of the times in terms of the counter responses from the critics is a lot of unsophistication versus um, sophistication. So uh, anyways, guys in the chat, thank you so much. If you're just getting here, we're going on two and a half hours. Uh, Dr. Dino was with us for the first hour or so. It was a ton of fun. Uh, it's always a blast with, with Kent. Um, so again, guys, thank you so much. Uh, tomorrow, I believe we have off and then we pretty well have shows for the, the remainder of the week with also a few debates for you too, guys. So again, look out for the endogenous retrovirus handbook. Uh, I would say within the next three to five hours, it will be available, but you will see a post and a notification so you can, uh, so you can pick it up. So let's leave it. Um, let's end this the way we started with, 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 with a good laugh. Laughter is the best medicine. And uh, to all the evolutionists, creationists, everybody, critics, non-critics, thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you so much for your feedback, your questions, your objections, your criticisms. We love them. We love them all. And that's why, guys, we do these live because we like interacting with the chat and uh, we like to see the engagement also that we get from the chat. So that being said, uh, Standing for Truth is out. Standing for Truth is going to go get another coffee and some dinner. So uh, <laughs> until we meet again, guys, God bless. Standing for Truth is out. You really think an amoeba turned into a shark and a whale and everything? There is no evidence of a single-cell creature ever producing even a two-celled creature, let alone an elephant or a whale or a human. But they put them on, draw lines on paper. Here we got the human and the snail related. Wade, simple question. Do you believe you are related to a snail? Just a yes or no. 
Yeah. Okay. So SpongeBob, or no, what's his name? Dave thinks he's a strawberry. PZ Myers thinks he's a fish. Um, who's the guy who thinks he's an ape? Uh, and you think you're related to a snail. Okay, you're welcome to believe that, but that's not science. Do you believe we all came from sponges, Dave? Do you believe this textbook yes. is right? Yes.